The flesh is that something on the inside of us that makes us want to act ungodly. It is that humanness within us. We still, even though we've been saved by the grace of God, the Bible says we have a new spirit, a new heart, there is still something within every single one of us that is temptable. There's something within all of us that oftentimes is drawn toward doing the wrong thing. Every single person has it. Anybody who denies it is just fooling himself or herself. Wouldn't it be great if we could become so spiritually mature that we never gave in to temptation? Well, that's not going to happen. But if you're a Christian, you're not doomed to failure either. Today's In Touch with Dr. Charles Stanley program begins a series titled Winning Over Life Struggles, and we kick it off with a lesson on persevering in the struggle of the flesh. Why do we have such struggles in our life? Now that we've trusted Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, we've been born again, we have the Holy Spirit living on the inside of us, why do we struggle the way we do? We struggle over relationships, we struggle over finances, we struggle about the job, we struggle about our children, we struggle about all kinds of things. We struggle about sin in our life. We struggle over the will of God even when we know what the will of the Lord is. We just struggle against what is right and oftentimes wonder why all that's taking place. Well, what are these struggles? Why do we struggle the way we do? Well, there are some very specific reasons. And one primary reason that I want to deal with in this message, and the title of this message is Winning Over the Struggle of the Flesh. Now, I want you to turn, if you will, to Galatians chapter 5, for in this chapter, the Apostle Paul deals with this very problem that every single one of us has. We all have something which the Bible calls the flesh. Now, we'll explain what that means in just a moment, but it's the basis of all of our problems as a believer. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says in this fifth chapter of Galatians, beginning in the 16th verse. Now, he's speaking primarily here to Christians. But now listen. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires or the lust of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desires against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. But if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident. That is, this is the way you act when the flesh is in control. The deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envy and drunkenness, carousing, and things like these of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Let us not become boastful, challenging one another, envying one another. Now, when you and I think about our enemies, the Bible says we have three primary enemies. First of all, there's the devil, which all of us are aware of. Secondly, the world system. When the Bible says the flesh, the world, the Bible speaks of the world. It's talking about the world system. That is, society as you and I know it without God. That's the world system. They operate apart from God and in opposition to God. The third one of our enemies is the one that's probably the least understood, and the one that brings about the most defeat in our life. And that's what the Apostle Paul calls the flesh. Now, a good example of this is in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Turn there, if you will. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul uh, is talking to the, uh, writing to the Christians here in Corinth. And you recall, he had a terrible time with this Corinthian church. I mean, they were so carnal and minded. In fact, this whole book is about to one problem after the other with them. But if you'll notice what he says and the way he uses this term, you'll understand what he's indicating. He says in chapter 3, verse 1, And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual men, but to men of flesh. Now, we're not talking about physical flesh. As to babes in Christ. 
I give you milk to drink. That is, I'm trying to teach you the simple, easy things to understand, not solid food, the more difficult things to understand. For you are not yet able to receive it. Indeed, even now you're not able, for you are still fleshly. What does that mean? Since there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not walking like mere men? And what was happening was this. Uh, the Apostle Paul, of course, came along and discipled these folks and established the church. And, and then, of course, other preachers came along like Apollos. And so what was happening was that some people were saying, well, now, I love the Apostle Paul. There's no one to match him. Apollos comes along who is very eloquent. And uh, someone says, well, now, I know Paul is, I know he was one of Christ's uh, chosen apostles back yonder somewhere, but listen, there's something about Apollos. Apollos, when he speaks, I mean, he just gets to me. I love Apollos. Well, I like Paul. Well, I don't know why you like Paul when I like Paulus. And what they were doing, they were getting in a discussion and argument with each other. He says, you're not grown up spiritually. You're acting in the flesh. The indication is that there's something about this flesh that is not good. And so Paul uses it here uh, in 1 Corinthians. So what in the world, back to Galatians chapter 5, what in the world does the Bible mean by the flesh? Well, we're not talking about this physical material flesh of which we're made. He's talking about a spiritual situation. Now listen carefully. The flesh is that something on the inside of us that makes us want to act ungodly. It is that humanness within us. We still, even though we've been saved by the grace of God, the Bible says we have a new spirit, a new heart, there is still something within every single one of us that is temptable. There's something within all of us that oftentimes is drawn toward doing the wrong thing. And this is what Paul meant when he said he found himself pulled. He says, now what I want to do, I find myself not doing. What I don't want to do, I find myself doing. What was he talking about? He was talking about this fleshly nature of his, that is, this humanness. All of us still have it. Even though you and I have been saved by the grace of God, God did not take away this humanness because you and I still live in a physical body. And in this physical body, we have desires and uh, we have needs we, we feel. And so uh, we want to get these needs met. And oftentimes, we want to indulge ourselves. We want to gratify uh, those legitimate needs and oftentimes gratify needs that are not legitimate. Well, what is it on the inside of us that makes us feel that? That's what he's talking about when he's talking about the flesh. That spirit within us, that, that desire within us, what he calls the flesh, that causes us to want to act ungodly. Every single person has it. Anybody who denies it is just fooling himself or herself. There's no such thing as the eradication of all sin in the life of the believer. It is sin within us, as Paul says, that causes us uh, to want to do what's wrong. But what I want you to see is I want you to see how the flesh acts. That is, this something on the inside of every single person, when it is left to itself, that is, when we give in to the flesh, how do we act? Well, this is the nature of what's on the inside of us. Galatians chapter 5, look, if you will, beginning in verse 17. He says, now, this naturalness within us, this which has been left over from our salvation experience, he says, the flesh sets its desire against the spirit. So first of all, we know that this fleshly spirit of ours, he says, it is against the spirit of God and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another so that you may not do the things that you please. That is, this fleshly something within us, whatever you want to call it, some people call it the old sin nature, whatever they want to call it. One thing is for certain, it is against God. It, it is against the spirit of God who is within us and it does everything within its power to keep you and me from living obediently before God. He says, you may not do the things that you please. So when you think about uh, this fleshliness of ours, you can't please God. It's hostile toward God, opposition toward God, and leading us away from God. If you look in Philippians chapter 3 for a moment, and you'll hear what Paul says in this uh, third uh, verse of chapter 3. He says the flesh is so bad, he said you absolutely cannot put any confidence in your own strength, in your own self to live the Christian life. Listen, verse 3 of Philippians 3, for we are the true circumcision, speaking of those who have believed, who worship in the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus, and he says we put no confidence in the flesh. That is, if you think that you can live the Christian life apart from the indwelling, infilling, empowering work of the Holy Spirit, he says you're going to be deceived because you cannot do it. 
He says, first of all, in the flesh, it's in opposition to God, hostile toward God, leading us away from God, cannot please God. No way to please God living in the naturalness. Now, when you were born, you came into the world with an old sinful nature. And the Lord God saved you, and the Holy Spirit came into your life to live on the inside of you. He did not take you out of this body. He did not take away your five senses. He did not take away your physical uh, and your emotional needs. They're all there. And so we have a spirit in the innermost part of us, a soul in which made up of the mind, the will, the emotions, the conscience, the consciousness, and then our physical body. And so between our spirit, where the Holy Spirit dwells in the life of the believer, and the body is the soul. That's our personality. That's how God made us. He said he breathed into man to this uh, physical body, and man became a living soul. The Spirit of God breathed into him. And so his spirit became a part of our spirit. We have this body, soul, and spirit. Now, the unbeliever has his own spirit, dead to the things of God. With our body, we relate to our environment. With our soul, that is our mind, will, and emotion, we relate to each other and ourselves. When the Holy Spirit is in our spirit, we can relate to God. The lost man can't relate to God because his spirit is dead to the things of God. And so what we have here is we have between the Spirit of God and, and our body, we have this soul of ours where we make decisions. And we choose to either follow the naturalness of the flesh or we choose to walk in obedience to the Spirit of God. The flesh cannot be improved upon, cannot be disciplined, cannot be changed. It is there because it is a part of what is left over of our old way of life before we were saved because we are still confined to this human body. And so we have to decide, all right, if this is true, how do we deal with this? Because it is in every single one of us. Now, how does the flesh express itself? Because it is going to express itself in lots of ways. Well, it's always going to have self at the center. That is when a person is walking in the flesh, walking in their sinfulness, walking in their humanness, self is going to be always at the center. Now, listen to this. I'm going to give you a long list of, of uh, how the flesh expresses itself in the human person. First of all, it expresses itself in self-will, self-centeredness, self-assertion, self-conceit, and self-love. Self-indulgence, self-pleasing, self-seeking, self-pity, and self-defense. Self-trust and self-sufficiency, self-consciousness, self-exaltation, self-righteousness, and self-glorying. All of those things are an indication that we are in the flesh, living out of our sinfulness, self-righteousness and self-glorying and all the rest. All of that is a part of it. And yet, listen, the unbelieving world, what are they doing? They're trying to satisfy some hunger, some need in their life. And so we look around, we see people who are conceited and arrogant and self this and self that, and we think, they ought to know better than that. No, they shouldn't. Because you see, to them, that is just natural and normal because they don't have anyone on the inside of them, first of all, to indicate that it's wrong, and secondly, no one on the inside of them to enable them to do better. So they're just going to do what comes naturally. Listen, you can be saved and act like the devil, amen? Because all of us have. And all we're doing is we're just acting like we used to act, didn't know any better, and couldn't do any better. Now we don't have an excuse for it. Then we had an excuse. The lost man, he doesn't know anything about Jesus. He's not saved. He doesn't have the power of the Holy Spirit. So he's just doing what comes naturally. But now you and I have the Spirit of God living on the inside of us. And because we do, we don't have to act that way anymore. But we do. And self, what happens is that self is on the throne. And when self is on the throne, then we have a problem. Now, According to this passage, here's what you'll notice. Paul says that when the flesh is free to express itself, it will express itself in one of or all four of these different ways. So he divides all sin up and categorizes them into four. Now look at this, if you will. He says in uh, verse 19, he says now, now watch the difference. The deeds, that is the works of the flesh. He says the works of the flesh are evident. He says it's very evident, which are... The first category is sexual immorality. Immorality, impurity, sensuality. And if you can't find it, we're talking about Galatians chapter 5, verse 19. First category is sexual immorality. He says, immorality, impurity, sensuality. The second category is idolatry, the worship of all kinds of things. He mentions here sorcery and all the things that go on. Idolatry, sorcery. The third category is rivalry. Enmities, strife, jealousies, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envies. Now, his purpose is not to name all sin, 
but so much of it is categorized there. And then the fourth category is drunkenness, he says, and revelry are all kinds of carousing. You can take all sin of every type and put them into one of those four categories. And so you and I live in a society in which the flesh is dominant in most people's lives. They are doing what normally they would naturally do to do what? All they're trying to do is gratify, satisfy, fill up this emptiness in their life. Naturally, they go to all kinds of extremes and spend all kinds of money to do it because there's a hunger. There's a hunger, there's a thirst. Within the emotional makeup of every person, there's the desire, for example, to be loved. There's a des desire to love. There's the de desire to feel secure. And so what happens? When we get in the flesh about security, people do all kinds of things to make more money, to feel more secure. And before long, their money has become their God because that's their security. And when they desire to be loved, they'll do any kind of almost anything in order to feel loved by somebody somehow. What is it? It is the natural, normal desires. There's a natural desire to want to be secure, natural desire to feel love, natural desire to have things to enjoy life. Now listen, that does not mean that having fun and enjoying life is fleshly. No, there are ways it can become fleshly, but the believer can have fun, enjoy life, and really be excited about life, really enjoy life without being in the flesh. But it's natural and normal in this physical body of ours. There are those needs that we feel. Uh, in these emotions of ours, we have lots of emotions. As we said, desire to be loved, desire to feel secure, a desire to feel wanted. All of these things are natural, normal part of life. Everybody has those. It is how we respond to them which determines whether we're in the flesh or in the spirit. You have to be sure that what you and I are doing, if we're doing it in the name of Jesus Christ, we're doing it because we love Him, motivated and can't do anything else rather than doing it in the flesh. Because the flesh is always what? Self, 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 self. It makes self feel good. It, it elevates self. It gets self-approval. It gets self-applause. It gets self, self, self. And so we have to examine it because a believer can live just as much in the flesh as a non-believer. Anything we do for self-exaltation is, is purely flesh. Now, that does not mean that a person could not uh, serve in some fashion and maybe not always do a very good job, but it's their motivation. Why are they doing it? And the deceptive thing about it is that a person can serve God and make a great public impression and at the same time be purely in the flesh. That's how deceptive and cunning and wicked and vile and sinful and indescribably wicked, this flesh of ours is. And I want to tell you again, you can't improve it. Don't work on it. It'll be a waste of your time. Because it has always been that way. It's always going to be that way. There's nothing redeemable about it. So let me ask you a question, a real simple question. In the light of this message, which is the pure truth of God's Word, are you walking in the flesh or are you walking in the Spirit? Is it your lifestyle? Can your life be characterized as one who's walking in the Spirit? Doesn't mean that you won't fall in the flesh at times. But when you do, confession, repentance immediately, and move on. Leave it behind you. God has forgiven you for that. Move on. Don't wallow in it. Don't listen to Satan begin to say, well, now, look, you've fallen now. It's not going to work. You've tried that. Don't listen to any of that kind of pure, satanic, hellish garbage. The Spirit of God within you quickens your spirit. That's not right. Confession, repentance, and move on. Don't wallow in it. Don't think about it. Don't talk about it. None of that's going to do you a bit of good. It is instantaneous confession and repentance, which means I turn from that God I, I, I choose to trust and the Holy Spirit to give me guidance and direction. It's a matter of choice. Now, you and I choose to walk by the Spirit or walk by the flesh. One is life and peace. The other is death and disappointment. May God grant you the wisdom to make the right choice. Now, you suppose you say, well, I'm not even a Christian. Well, let me tell you how this starts. You ask the Lord Jesus Christ to forgive you of your sin based on what He did at the cross. And when the moment you ask Him to forgive you and tell Him that you're placing your trust in Him, the Holy Spirit seals you as a child of God, indwells you, and from that moment on, now you have the person that Jesus called our helper living on the inside of you to give you understanding and to strengthen you to make wise, right choices in your life. And that is my prayer for you.
Thanks for joining us today for In Touch with Dr. Charles Stanley. His message, The Struggle of the Flesh, continues tomorrow. When making decisions, remember to ignore your self-centered desires and yield to the Holy Spirit. That won't always be easy, but you'll experience the joy and peace that comes from following Christ. If you have a pressing concern, we'd like to help. Browse our website, intouch.org, for devotions, Bible-based study tools, and relevant articles on many topics. And if you'd like to have a copy of Dr. Stanley's complete message, you can order online. The title is The Struggle of the Flesh, or order his teaching set, Winning Over Life Struggles. Again, that's intouch.org, or call one 800 in touch. You can write to us at In Touch, Post Office Box 7900, Atlanta, Georgia 30357. Some measure their success by wealth, others by their prestige. Learn the biblical definition of success coming up in today's Moment with Charles Stanley. We all want to be blessed, but what does being blessed mean to you? Things, family, happiness? No matter what we do, where we go, what we achieve, we always want more, don't we? More time, more money, more peace. We chase after a blessed life, but the problem is our culture makes it difficult to know what being blessed is all about. Jesus made it all clear when he gave his Sermon on the Mount in the Gospel of Matthew. He described a life that doesn't depend on your bank account, where you live or work, or what you own. It's a life that rests not on external circumstances, but on the interior condition of the heart. It's a life that's richer and fuller than anything this world could ever match. Join us for Blessed to Be, our year-long focus on the Beatitudes, and experience the life you were truly meant to live. Discover more at intouch.org slash blessed. That's intouch.org slash blessed. Would you say you're successful? Would God agree with you? Learn the real measure of success in A Moment with Charles Stanley. Well, first of all, the most important place of success in our lives is our relationship to Him. So a lot of people want to be successful. What they mean is popularity, prestige, prominence, and all the rest. If you ask yourself the question, what does it mean to be successful? Here's what success is. Success is discovering the will of God and walking obediently in that will by faith, growing in your intimate relationship with Him. You know what? That's the sum total of it all, really. Everything else that God may provide or send or or restrict from us, that's just part of His way. Because if I should ask you or anyone else, what makes you happy in life? That people got all the money in the world, all the prestige, all the prominence, everything in the world that they could possibly want, they are absolutely miserable. And then here's a person who has none of that, had this awesome, quiet, intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. And you know, there are a lot of people who've got all of that, would swap all of that for what this person has who has none of that. Because if you'll think about this, people who have all that, oftentimes, what does God do to get them to Himself? takes it all away. People have said, you know what, I was a millionaire, I was this, I had everything going, and all of a sudden I lost it all, and it drove me to God. Anyone who humbly trusts in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of their sin has a relationship with God. Learn more at intouch.org. If you missed any of today's message, or if you'd like to hear it again, visit our website. You can also stream previous messages from the audio archives or download a variety of podcasts. Find these and many other resources at intouch.org. And if there's someone who needs the message you heard today, prayerfully share it with them with love as your motivation. And let us know how we can pray. Does it seem like you're always fighting a battle with yourself? If you're a believer, don't forget that the Holy Spirit is your helper. Be encouraged when you join us Thursday for In Touch with Dr. Charles Stanley. This program is a presentation of In Touch Ministries, Atlanta, Georgia, and remains on this station through the grace of God and your faithful prayers and gifts. Once you've been saved by the grace of God, the Holy Spirit is living on the inside of you, then When we think about what He's done for our life, here's what we see. 
The Spirit of God came into our life to enable us to do what you and I could not do. He knew that you and I could not be the persons that He wants us to be, and so He knew that it wasn't enough. Here's what I want you to understand, that when Jesus Christ went to the cross, He died for our sins, S-I-N-S. That took care of my forgiveness and made me fit for heaven. But what about living here and now? Picture this. It's first thing in the morning, but instead of picking up your Bible, you grab your phone to scroll through social media. If you feel like you're often giving in to the lure of doing the opposite of what you know you need to do, stay with us. Today's In Touch with Dr. Charles Stanley program teaches believers how to deal with the struggle of the flesh. When have you learned the most about God? When have you discovered what God's really like? You and I grow not by floating along with ease in the Christian life. We grow why? We grow when we struggle. We learn the sustaining power of God in the midst of struggle. We learn this awesome capacity of the Holy Spirit when we're able to say no to temptation. We learn what it means to place our trust in God when financially things look so bad and the struggle is there. Well, shall I do this or shall I do that? And Satan says, well, just go make yourself a big loan. God says, trust me. Make yourself a big loan. Trust me. It's easy to do this way. Trust me. Everybody does this. Trust me. And so what do we have? We have this tension. It'll always be there. That is, the, the capacity is always there. Why didn't God just eliminate that? Because it is in our struggles that we discover what he's like. We learn the amazing things about God we'd never learn if we floated into heaven on a bed of ease. And so... Here's what he did. He decided it would be much wiser to, in order to keep you and me absolutely dependent upon him, to keep our focus upon him, to keep our sense of awareness of our need for him, and to keep us praising him and rejoicing over him. Listen, he left just enough to keep you and me realizing that apart from him, we will never make it. Now think about this. He said that you and I have been predestined to be conformed to the likeness of Christ. And so we've been predestined to be conformed to the likeness of Christ. That means we're not there. If we're not there, what happens? Because we're over here in the flesh. And so now that we've trusted Jesus Christ as our Savior, our desire is to grow into Christ's likeness. So, which brings me to this point. That is the confidence that you and I can have that we can live in the Spirit and not live in the flesh. Look, if you will, in verse 16. In one single verse, the Apostle Paul gives us an awesome sense of assurance here that you and I can live in the Spirit. We don't have to give in to the flesh. He says in verse 16, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. When he uses this term walk, he's talking about a lifestyle. That is, that our lifestyle is to walk in the Spirit. That means daily it is the habit of our life. It's the nature of our life. It is our habit. It is our lifestyle to do what? To walk in obedience to God, to please Him, to honor Him by our conduct, by our conversation, by our character. That's our desire, walking in the Spirit. He says now when we choose to walk by the Spirit, and when he uses the word by here, that is the enablement of the Spirit, empowered by the Spirit, as a result of the Spirit working within us, he said, then we will not fulfill the desires or the lust of the flesh, which is always there. Now, that's what he says. What we have to ask is this, and that is, how does all this take place? Well, think about it this way. When you're not trusted Jesus Christ as our Savior, listen, God dealt with our sins, S-I-N-S. When he went to the cross, the Bible says God placed upon him all of our sins for the whole world and we were forgiven. That is, our forgiveness became a reality the moment you and I accepted Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. So that His dying on the cross took care of our sins. S-I-N-S. You know what that did? That fitted every single person who trusts Jesus as Savior. That fits us for heaven. So you and I who believe us, we're not worried about going to heaven. That's not even an issue with us. What made you saved is the atoning death of Jesus Christ, not your behavior, not your conduct. You're saved by His precious blood, not behavior and conduct, and therefore, because you've been saved by something He did, you can't undo what He did. Once He sealed you with His Holy Spirit, you can't take the seal off. You may sin against God. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about what we have to deal with because we have this flesh. Now, once you've been saved by the grace of God, the Holy Spirit is living on the inside of you, then when we think about what He's done for our life, here's what we see. 
The Spirit of God came into our life to enable us to do what you and I could not do. He knew that you and I could not to be the persons that He wants us to be, and so He knew that it wasn't enough. Now, listen carefully so you won't misunderstand me. Do not go out and tell anybody, I said Jesus Christ's death wasn't enough. I would never say that. Here's what I want you to understand, that when Jesus Christ went to the cross, He died for our sins, S-I-N-S. That took care of my forgiveness and made me fit for heaven. But what about living here and now? The fact that he died for my sin, I've got something to deal with, and it's called the flesh. His dying on the cross took care of my S-I-N-S. He said to his disciples, it is expedient for you that I go away. If I do not go away, the Holy Spirit will not come, but if I go away, I will send him. He'll be in you and with you. He will abide with you forever. 14th chapter of John. He says, he will abide within you forever. Not just with you, but in you. He will be in you forever. Now, Jesus knew before he left, that those disciples would never be able to live the Christian life. They would never be able to serve him because they'd have to do it in their own strength. Friend, listen to me carefully. Things haven't changed. We have no more assurance that you and I can live the Christian life, do the work that God has called us to do and do it well and do it successfully apart from the Holy Spirit than they did. He said, look, you sit out in Jerusalem and you wait till you are clothed with power from on high. They could not do it. You and I cannot live this Christian life in our own strength. We can't do it. I wish somebody had said to me when I was saved. I wish they had said, now look, here's what you can expect when you become a Christian. Now that you're saved, the Holy Spirit has come on the inside of you. Now here's what he'll do. He will enable you. He will strengthen you. He will reveal to you. He'll make you perceptive. He'll give you insights. He'll give you understanding. He'll show you when, when this is wrong. He'll show you when this is right. He'll enable you to make the wise choices in your life. You're always going to have struggles in life, but he'll be there to help you. Nobody told me that. So what did I do? I went along as, a, as 12, 13, 14 years of age wondering what in the world is wrong with my life. Why do I sin? Lord, I've been saved. What, what's going on in my life? Nobody ever sent me down to tell me that, listen, even though you have, you have been born again by the grace of God, you are still human and you're going to have to deal with your humanness. And the only way to deal with your humanness is through the power of the Holy Spirit. That's why anybody who tries to live the Christian life and has no understanding of the work of the Holy Spirit, I'm telling you, you're absolutely totally doomed to failure. You cannot do it. You know why God, listen, God knew you couldn't. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, apart from the cross, there'd have been nothing. And this is why Paul said, I've been crucified with Christ. What did he mean? Here's what he meant. He meant that when Jesus Christ died, he made it possible for all of us. Listen, he died for our sins. He made it possible for us to die to sin. That is, in order through the Holy Spirit, you and I could say no. No, no, no to sin. Apart from Jesus' death at the cross and apart from the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, we couldn't do that. Listen, we're on our own apart from the Spirit. And I think about so many millions and millions of Christians who have no understanding of the work of the Holy Spirit, who think that he's some fantasy or some ghost out there because the Bible calls him a Holy Ghost. Friend, you and I cannot live this Christian life apart from the work of the Spirit. Listen to what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 3. Look at this, if you will and his emphasis on the power of the Spirit in his own life. And this is what uh, he was attempting to teach all of those who would listen to him. He says in this third chapter, look if you will, verse 7, he says, speaking of the gospel of which I was made a minister, according to the gift of God's grace which was given to me, according to the working of his power, only as the Spirit of God works in us. Then if you'll notice another verse here, he says, uh, in verse uh, 16, he says, praying now, he says that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man. He says, here's what I'm praying. I'm praying that you'll be strengthened. That is, that your spirit will be strengthened by the Holy Spirit working on the inside of you. Then verse 20. Now to him who is able to do exceeding abundantly beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works within us. Now I want you to turn to a passage of Scripture that sounds just like you and me. If you want to see yourself before you are saved and you want to see yourself when you get in the flesh, here we are. Romans chapter 7. Now look, this is the Apostle Paul, God's chosen choice servant, knew more about him than anyone else. Listen to what Paul said about himself. Look in verse 15. For that which I'm doing, I do not understand. For I'm not practicing what I'd like to do. I'm doing the very thing I hate. 
But if I do the very thing I do not wish to do, I agree with the law, confessing that it's good. That is, the law says that's wrong. He says, well, that's true. So now, no longer am I the one doing it, but sin, sin, which indwells me. He says, that's not what I want to do. Why do I do these things I don't want to do? He says, it's sin, it's the old flesh. Verse 18, for I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my what? In my flesh, in my naturalness. There's nothing good there. For the wishing is present in me, but the doing of good is not. For the good that I wish, I, don't, I do not do. But I practice the very evil that I do not wish. But if I'm doing the very thing I do not wish, I'm no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. He said, now look, that's not the real Paul. That's not what I want to do, but I find myself doing it. Why? The flesh. The, 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 the strong, drawing, wooing, pulling, tugging of the flesh. Move in this direction. This is what will satisfy you. This will gratify you. What does the flesh say? Well, if you want a good example of how the flesh operates, watch some commercials. I mean, these commercials are wrapped up in pure flesh. Do you know why they do it that way? Listen, isn't it not true that oftentimes the worst ones are the most colorful, had to be the most expensive, the most dramatic, the most action-filled commercials? You know why they do that? Because it appeals to the flesh. I mean, they say, well, if you drive this or if you live there, if you wear this, what does it lift? Old self. And so what do we, we fall right in that trap. We say, yeah, 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 that's right, yeah. That's what the world is saying. Listen, these commercials, they are born of the flesh. Now, is that wrong? It works. You know why it works? Because every single one of us has the same flesh. Every single one of us. You could take the flesh out of every single one of us, line it all up, you couldn't tell one of us from the other. Why? Because it, was, it all has the same source, an old sinful nature which began in the Garden of Eden. It's all there. And so when you think about uh, uh, what's going on in your life and you look back here at the Apostle Paul and you think, Lord, if that happened to him, now I understand what's going on inside of me. Romans 7, verse 24. Listen to what he says. Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? Wretched man that I am, who will set me free? Listen, don't you know that every alcoholic said that? Every drug addict said that? Every sex addict has said that? People who are hooked on all kinds of things have said that? Oh, wretched man that I am, who can deliver me from this, this body of death, this thing that's killing me and destroying me and wrecking my body? Who shall deliver me? Chapter 8, verse 1. He says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. He says, We've been set free. Now listen, if I don't know that I've been set free, if I don't know that the power of the flesh has been broken, if I don't know that, what am I going to do? I'm just going to submit. I'm going to yield. I'm going to keep walking in the flesh. So how, when he says, if you walk in the Spirit, if you walk by the Spirit, you'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So I want to give you three words. They're simple words, but I'm here to tell you, you cannot substitute anything else for them. These three words make the difference. How do we walk by the Spirit? Remember what he said in Galatians chapter 5, now verse 16. He said, now, I say by the Spirit. I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. Three words. What's the first one? Here's the first word. The first word is this, persuasion. Until I am persuaded that I cannot live this Christian life apart from the Holy Spirit, I will keep on trying and I will find myself living in the flesh. Persuasion, persuaded that I absolutely cannot live the Christian life apart from the work of the Holy Spirit and cannot serve God in any fashion successfully and acceptably before God apart from the Holy Spirit. Fully persuaded. If you think you can, here's what you'll do. You'll go in your own strength. You see, you and I cannot serve God today and be successful and just depend upon our experiences and our self tomorrow and make it work. That's not the way God operates. That's why He left us enough flesh. He left us enough humanness that we have to depend upon Him every time, all the time, or we get in the flesh. Persuaded, persuaded that I cannot live the Christian life? Now, has this not been true in your life? Maybe you were faced with some temptation in life, and finally you think, well, boy, I, I, I've conquered that one. Friend, don't ever say that. When you say, I've conquered that one, you know what you did? 
flesh pushes a button and everything on the inside of you revs up for defeat. Because when you say, I think I've conquered that, you and I haven't conquered anything. And has it not been true? We thought we, we'd taken care of that in our life and that was over with. The next thing we know, we're down on our knees doing what? Confessing the same old sin. Why? Because, friend, it is a daily. If you're not persuaded that you can't live it, you're going to try in your own strength, and I'm here to tell you, you're going down. It is true of every single one of us. There is no exception. There's no such thing as no one being so spiritually minded, so spiritually oriented that they can do without depending upon the Holy Spirit every single day. Nobody. It doesn't make difference who you are. There's no level. There's no strata. There's no position up here that you get where it doesn't make any difference anymore. Now listen. He said in Romans 8, 29 that he predestined you and me to be conformed to his likeness. Now that predestined means that God has already foreordained and he has settled the issue that every single one of his children is going to be conformed to his likeness. That's a process. Now listen carefully. You and I may live our life, and listen carefully now, while the flesh stays the same, if you and I approach the flesh in the proper fashion, then there will be more expressions of the life of Christ in us, in our conduct, in our conversation, in our behavior. There will be more of Jesus seen in us. Does that mean that we've improved the flesh? Absolutely not. Flesh is the same. It means that we came to settle persuasion that we can't do it. He's going to have to do it in us. First word is persuasion. The second word is surrender. This isn't a one-time get on your knees at somebody's altar and make some awesome surrender of your life to God. It's not what we say when people say, well, you know, I surrendered my life to the Lord. When? Well, uh, two weeks ago. And, uh, and so now what? Friend, listen, it is daily. Sometimes it's hourly and sometimes it's moment by moment. How often do I have to make a surrender? Every time I have to make a decision, there has to be a surrender. For example, if you're making a decision financially, is this the will of God or is it not? It's a decision you have to make. If it's a decision about relationships, it doesn't make any difference what it is. You see, it's moment by moment. It is surrender. To surrender what? It's not surrendering your money and surrendering this and surrendering that and surrendering all those things. Listen, you can surrender all that stuff a thousand different times. That's not the issue. What must I surrender? I must surrender my will to the Holy Spirit who is inside in my spirit who desires for my spirit to control my will, which will control my body, which will control what I look at, what I hear, what I say, and how I act in every aspect and every use of this human body. It is the surrender of my will. How often do I do that? Every time I'm challenged, every time I have to make a decision. And this is why you and I have to be alert as the children of God. Listen, we don't make a decision once. We make a continuing decision a series of decisions. First word, what is the first word? Persuasion. The second word is what? Surrender. And the third word is just this. It's just simple, but it's the key. It's trusting him. I'm going to trust him that if I surrender myself to him in this situation, he is going to enable me. He will strengthen me. He will give me direction. He will be to me exactly what I need in this situation. So how do we walk by the Spirit? We walk by the Spirit. Listen, being fully persuaded that apart from him, it's not going to work. Surrendering my life to him moment by moment and trusting him to be in me, with me, for me, through me, to me, every single thing that I need at that moment, no matter what it is. Now you say, well, does that mean that uh, you can reach some stage where you won't sin anymore? No, it does not. How we all wish it would, but that's not the way it is. You know what that means? It means till the moment you breathe your last breath, every single one of us are absolutely, totally dependent upon the living Holy Spirit on the inside of us to enable us, listen, to win over the struggles of life, especially the struggle of the flesh. Father, we love you and praise you and thank you for the wonderful truth of your Word, the simplicity of it, the awesomeness of it, the power of it, the delight of it, the joy of it, and the peace that comes when we begin to apply it to our heart. How we do pray that multitudes of people will hear this message and be saved. Multitudes of believers will hear this message and be confident for the first time in their life that they can, by the power of the Holy Spirit, live the life that their hearts so desire. I pray, Father, that the Spirit of God will sink this message deep, seal it tight, and work it out moment by moment and day by day in all of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.
You're listening to In Touch with Dr. Charles Stanley. Those of us who are believers are not powerless in our struggle with the flesh. We can turn away from temptation and yield our will to the Lord Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. You'll find insight on learning to trust the Lord through times of temptation at intouch.org. Browse our many helpful resources that can help you walk in faithfulness. And to order a copy of Dr. Stanley's complete message, The Struggle of the Flesh, visit our online bookstore. It's also included in his teaching set, Winning Over Life Struggles. Again, you'll find these resources at intouch.org or call 1-800-IN-TOUCH. To write to us, address your letter to In Touch, Post Office Box 7900, Atlanta, Georgia, 30357. Let's say you're ready to take the next step towards something you really want to do. Is it God's will? How do you know? Advice for Believers is coming up in today's Moment with Charles Stanley. We all want to be blessed, but what does being blessed mean to you? Things, family, happiness? No matter what we do, where we go, what we achieve, we always want more, don't we? More time, more money, more peace. We chase after a blessed life, but the problem is our culture makes it difficult to know what being blessed is all about. Jesus made it all clear when he gave his Sermon on the Mount in the Gospel of Matthew. He described a life that doesn't depend on your bank account, where you live or work, or what you own. It's a life that rests not on external circumstances, but on the interior condition of the heart. It's a life that's richer and fuller than anything this world could ever match. Join us for Blessed to Be, our year-long focus on the Beatitudes, and experience the life you were truly meant to live. Discover more at intouch.org slash blessed. That's intouch.org slash blessed. From the pastor's heart is Dr. Charles Stanley's personal letter to you. Each month you'll enjoy biblical insight, encouragement, and inspiration. To receive from the pastor's heart each month, call 1-800-IN-TOUCH. Godly wisdom is promised to every believer. We just need to ask and wait for the Lord's answer. Here's a moment with Charles Stanley. When you begin to ask the Lord to speak to your heart, what you have to remember is this, you have to give Him time. You have to be quiet and listen, and He will show you. He will show you in different ways. But the major issue here is not only do you ask Him, but do you give Him time to answer that and to speak to your heart. And there have been many times when I've asked Him about something, and when did I get the answer? I may be sitting in a restaurant by myself, and all of a sudden, God shows me the answer. Or driving down the highway, or reading His Word. But the truth is, He will make it very, very clear. Now, here's one thing you have to always remember. If you believe that God is telling you to do something, you go to the Word of God and be sure what you think you've heard does not contradict the Word of God. A believer may not always hear correctly, but the Bible always speaks correctly. Learn more about understanding and applying what you read in Scripture at intouch.org. Would you like to hear today's message again? You can stream it on our website or download podcasts and take In Touch with you. Our web address again is intouch.org. Is there something that repeatedly trips you up in your walk with Christ? Be sure to join us tomorrow to hear clear biblical guidance for winning the struggle with temptation. That's Friday on In Touch with Dr. Charles Stanley. This program is a presentation of In Touch Ministries, Atlanta, Georgia, and remains on this station through the grace of God and your faithful prayers and gifts. There will never be found a single solitary reason that we doubt that can be traced back to God. He is absolutely, perfectly, unalterably, unchangeably the holy God He claims to be. And every single thing He promises, He has not the power to do it, but the will to do it. And He will do it because it is His nature to do so. Doubt doesn't fit who we are. Because you see, we are the children of God. We are followers of Jesus Christ. And the Bible says we're to walk by faith, not by doubt. Have you lost confidence in God's promises? 
Do you maybe even question his love for you? Welcome to In Touch with Dr. Charles Stanley and our series, Winning Over Life Struggles. Today's program urges us to anchor ourselves to the Word of God because embracing the Lord's unchangeable truths will secure us when we struggle with doubt. How many times have you gotten on your knees and told the Lord what your need was, and you know in your heart that He says He'll supply all of your needs, and then you walked away thinking, well, I certainly hope so. Well, I, I know I asked Him, and I know what He promised. I certainly hope so. Or maybe you have found some promise in the Word of God that relates to exactly what you've been praying about. And so you read the promise, you believed exactly what it said, and the next day you're thinking, well, I hope so. I'm not sure. Or maybe somewhere along the way you've been asked to serve in the church where you belong, and you told them, yes, you would. And then the day before you were supposed to serve, maybe on that Saturday you called the pastor or someone, you said, well, you know, I've been thinking about that, and somehow I just don't think I quite have the ability, the talent to do that. I don't think I'm going to do that. All of those are the result of doubt. Doubting God for this, doubting God for the other, and doubting oftentimes yourself. And that's what I want to talk about in this message in our series on winning over those situations and circumstances in life that cause us trouble. So we call them winning over the struggles of life. So I want you to turn, if you will, to James chapter 1. James chapter 1, and I want us to read the second through the eighth verses together. James chapter 1, verse, beginning in verse 2. He says, Now consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all men generously, and without reproach, and it will be given to him or to her. But let him ask in faith without any doubting, for the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man expect that he will receive anything from the Lord, being a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Now, it's in the context of this passage that I want us to look at something all of us have to deal with in our life, because there are times when all of us doubt Maybe we don't doubt that God exists, but we doubt certain things that He says, or we doubt that He'll work it out in our life. We may say, well, I, I can see how God will work it out in someone else's life, but sometimes we don't see how He'll work it out in our life. So first of all, I want to clarify some terms here. And if somebody should ask you, well, what is the definition of faith? Well, they give you all kinds of definitions, but the very accurate biblical definition of faith. If you took a Greek dictionary and said, well, what is, the, what is the actual definition of that word as it is used here? It simply means this. It means to be convinced of something. That's what the word believe means, that I am convinced of something. If I have faith in something, I am convinced of it. Well, doubt would mean that I am not convinced of it. Very simple. There's a hesitation in my believing. For some reason, I'm not quite willing to commit myself to believe, yes, that is the truth. On the other hand, unbelief is a positive rejection of it. So that if I say, well, I do believe it, that's one thing. If I doubt it, I have some hesitation, reservation, not willing to commit myself, yes, I do. But unbelief is a positive rejection. No, I don't. For example, if I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, then what I'm saying is, yes, I do believe what the Bible says, that, that Jesus Christ is the eternal, virgin-born Son of God. If I doubt that, I would say, well, it's possible. I know that's what the Bible says, but I'm not sure that's true. Unbelief says, absolutely, I do not believe there's any such thing as an eternal Son of God. Now, if you'll think about that, it is a reflection upon God. I know that's what He says, but I'm not sure that's what He'll do. It is an implication that either the Word of God is not true or if it is true that God will not always do what He says He will do. So you and I have major problems in our life if we have doubts about God, doubts about His Word, or doubts how He operates in our life. And most of us don't realize the kind of penalty we have already paid in our life as a result of doubting Him. None of us know what we've missed in life as a result of maybe opportunities that came our way, and yet when they came our way, we were either too fearful for some reason because we doubted what God said He would do. 
Now, when you think about all the things that people doubt in their life, think about it for a moment. People doubt that God loves them. Or they doubt that the Bible is true. They doubt that God will empower them to do what he's called them to do. They doubt that they can make it in their business. Uh, they doubt uh, the promises of God. They doubt when someone says, well, you're just looking fantastic or I really love you. They can't even receive it. They doubt someone else's love. They doubt their salvation. They doubt their eternal security. They doubt that God answers their prayer. They doubt that he will forgive their sin. And they doubt their whole capacity in life to become and to achieve the things that God has set for them. So what happens is they go through life not realizing what it's costing them to doubt God. Now, when we say that unbelief is one thing and doubt is another, unbelief is a positive rejection. Doubt is just enough to cause us a major problem. Well, I think it's possible, but no, I'm not sure. Well, you and I know where all of that came from because when Satan was introduced in the Garden of Eden, remember what he said to Eve? He said, now, indeed, did God say that you must not eat of the tree in the midst of the garden? Is that really what he said? Creating some sense of doubt. Satan is always the source of all doubt. So what I want us to talk about for a few moments is this. What are the causes of our doubt? What would cause me to read the Word of God, walk away and say, well, I know that's what it said, but I'm not sure. What would cause me to look at a specific promise that relates to a specific need that is given in the Word of God, and I say, well, I know that's what it says. I know that's a specific promise. It's exactly what I need, but I'm not sure God will do that for me. What are the causes? Well, number one, so I want to give you a list, and um, you'd be very wise if you jot this list down. One of the primary reasons uh, for our doubt is our ignorance of the Word of God. If I do not know what the Word of God says, I will doubt many things about life. For example, he says, he will supply all of our needs. Well, if I have a need and I ask God to supply that need, uh, should I expect him to do so when he says, my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus? If I doubt him, I'm doubting the faithfulness of God. Doubt is devastating to us. And one of the primary reasons is because of our ignorance of the Word of God. A second primary reason is our misunderstanding of who God is and what He's like. Somebody says, well, now I know that God loves the world because John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. I know that's what it says. But somehow I can't believe that God loves me when I'm disobedient to Him. So therefore, I believe God loves me sometimes. I believe He doesn't love me to others. But the Bible says in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, but God commended His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, not after we straightened up our conduct, not after our behavior changed. God loved us in an unsaved, unredeemed state. And so our misunderstanding of God that He loves us sometimes and not all the time. He loves me when I feel like it. He doesn't love me when I don't feel like it. And someone says, well... I know the Bible says that if we confess our sins, that uh, He'll forgive us. And uh, I've confessed my sins, but I'm not sure. You see, I'm just not sure God will forgive me because, you see, there's so many things back then in my background, and there's so many times I've sinned against God, and somehow I just believe God must be sick and tired of forgiving me, and I have to ask Him to forgive me for the same old thing over and over again. How do I know if God's going to forgive me? I just think God must be fed up with me because I don't feel forgiven. And so what happens is they go by their feelings, go by what other people say, but primarily by their feelings. And so they don't understand the very nature of God that His love is unconditional and nothing can change that love. And so two of the primary reasons, ignorance of the Word of God and ignorance really of a misunderstanding of, of who God is and what He's like. A third reason is sin and guilt in our life. Now listen, sin and feelings of guilt will short circuit our faith instantly. When a person is sinning against God and living in sin, and when they're overwhelmed with a sense of doubt, it is extremely difficult, if not impossible, to really and truly believe God. Because here's what happens. Sin short-circuits our faith, causing doubt. And then once we begin to doubt God about one thing, we'll begin to doubt Him about other. This creates fear, frustration, anxiety in our life, and so we become rather useless to God because we are so overwhelmed with doubt overwhelmed with the accusations of Satan. And that's exactly what it is. The Bible says he is the great accuser. He will accuse us of things that God has forgiven us for. And so what happens is we begin to doubt. 
I think a primary reason that we doubt, and listen carefully about this one, you'll misunderstand. And that is because of the work of the Holy Spirit in our life. Now listen, the Holy Spirit would never cause you and me to doubt the Word of God or to doubt anything about God. What He will cause us to do is to doubt a sense of direction that we're headed in when He knows that is not the will of God. And so if we head in a direction and we begin to have doubts and uncertainties, that's the Holy Spirit protecting us, sending us signals, this is not the will of God, this is not the way of God, this is not in keeping with the Word of God, you're not going to like what's on the other end of this. And so we begin to doubt that sense of direction or something we may be thinking about doing. Maybe we're not certain about it, and maybe we don't have God's Word on it. And so, He leaves and allows that doubt to be there in order to protect us from making the wrong decision. So, when we talk about the Holy Spirit causing doubt, we're not talking about Him causing doubt in the Word or in the person of God Himself. Another thing that happens is this, and that is we get our focus on the wrong thing. That is, we, we have a wrong focus, and as a result, we're going to get doubtful. Most of us, when we are going through some circumstance of difficulty, is it not true that the more we look at our situation, the more we look at our problem, what happens to it? The more you look at it, what happens to it? The bigger it gets. And so when our focus gets off of God on our circumstance, and the larger that circumstance becomes, finally we're looking up over it, and we're looking around at it so big, we begin to doubt. Because what happens is, when I get my focus off God, something happens to my attitude. Something will happen to my conversation, something will happen to my conduct, and then I'm in trouble. And so, one of the primary reasons we doubt is because we get our focus in the wrong direction. Another reason we doubt is because of previous failures in our life. All of us have been through circumstances back yonder where it didn't come out to suit us. And we said, well, I, I think I was trusting God. I thought I was, and maybe I made a mistake. And so we all make mistakes. We all have those uh, periods of failure in our life. None of us are perfect. We all make those kind of mistakes. That's the way we grow in our Christian life. And so as a result of looking back, and Satan will say, well, see there, look back yonder. You thought you knew the will of God then, but you didn't. So you made a mistake then. And so what happens is we look back at previous mistakes, previous failures, or previous times when we were learning to discover the will of God, learning to listening to Him. And because we made a mistake, we think, well, well, we'll make it again. When that is not absolutely true at all. And so we begin to doubt whether we know how to listen to God or not or what He will do. One of the primary reasons we doubt God, listen, is the negative influence of others. It is amazing to me how a Christian can say to another, how do you think you know God? Here you are, you've been a Christian for years and years and years, and you say you believe the Bible, and you say, well, you just can't be sure. You just cannot be certain. And oftentimes when a person uh, uh, does not believe in eternal security, they'll say, well, you know, I believe the Bible from cover to cover. Well, I'll give them a bunch of verses, and they'll say, well, but I just don't believe that you can be absolutely certain. Well, why not? Well, I just don't think you can. Well, give me a reason. Well, because uh, you just, how, how are you going to be sure that when you die, you're going to heaven because God said so. Well, I know that's what he says, but how can you be sure? Well, you either believe him or you don't believe him. And so you can't convince somebody of something if they don't believe the Word of God. It all boils down to either God is absolutely faithful to what he says or he's not. One of the two, that's the only, only alternatives we have. And so when you look at all the reasons that people doubt, ask yourself the question, when you have doubted God, doubted His Word, doubted your capacity, doubted your abilities, doubted your talents, doubted your adequacy to meet a certain situation, what was the root of it? What caused it? Was it something you were taught? Uh, was it something that happened back down in your life? Certainly, not a single one of us can say, the reason I doubt God is because God failed, because God doesn't keep His Word. Because God isn't true. Listen, there will never be found a single solitary reason that we doubt that can be traced back to God. He is absolutely, perfectly, unalterably, unchangeably the holy God He claims to be. And every single thing He promises, He has not the power to do it, but the will to do it. And He will do it because it is His nature to do so. Doubt doesn't fit who we are. Because you see, we are the children of God. We are followers of Jesus Christ. And the Bible says we're to walk by faith, not by doubt. But many people walk by doubt and don't even realize that they're doing it. They don't think they are. So let's look at this passage now for a few moments and think in terms of what is the character of a doubter. He says now, 
going through difficulty and trial, he said, you'll need wisdom. He says, now, if you lack wisdom, let each one of us ask of God who will give us liberally, abundantly, and not come back and say, why did you ask for that? When he says in this passage, look at this. He says, he says that he will give it to us generously without reproach. He's not going to come back and criticize us for asking him for what we need. So he says he's willing to do it. Now, you can put wisdom in here, any other thing we need. Then he says, but let him ask in faith without any doubting. He says, don't let him ask doubting. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. Let not that man or that woman expect to receive anything from the Lord. Being a double-minded man or woman, a person, unstable in all their ways. Now, what is he saying? First of all, he says, those people who come to God, who are doubtless, they're unsuccessful in their prayer life. Now, here's what he says. Look, it couldn't be any clearer. He says, let him or her ask in faith without any doubting. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven by the winds and tossed. Let not that person think or believe they're going to receive anything from God. Why? Here's the reason. He says they're like the waves of the sea, up and down, up and down, up and down. Whether he is God or he's not God, he is true or he's not true, he made the promise, but he may not keep it. And so he says the person who's a doubter, he says, first of all, they're unsuccessful. It's not going to work. They're not going to get any prayers answered. If they don't get any prayers answered, listen, something, something's really wrong. Secondly, he says everything is uncertain. Let not that man think that he'll receive anything of the Lord. He says he's like the waves of the sea, driven by the winds and tossed up and down. Then he says not all that. He says he's unstable in all of his ways. Now, what does that mean? Here's what it means. That doubt has been allowed to seep into that person's life, seep into every area of that life, and now that person is indecisive and unstable, uncertain, and of course, there's always going to be fear when there's all that uncertain and doubt and indecision. Now, when a person's living like that, they're living like the person they're not if they're saved. When you not trusted Jesus Christ as our Savior, we believe the witness of God about His Son. You and I have said we're willing to believe the Word of God, this book right here. In fact, we believe it to the most critical, crucial test, that, that the moment I know I'm, my, my heart's going to beat the last time and I'm going to die, I'm going to die with absolute confidence that the moment I die, I'm going to be in the presence of God. How do I know that? Nobody has ever come back and told me I've never gotten any word from heaven, some audible voice of somebody who's up there. The only reason I believe that and the only reason you and I are absolutely fearless of death is because we read it in the Word of God, the inerrant, infallible Word of God. You and I have based our whole eternity on what is written in ink on these white pages. Now, if I'm willing to bet my whole eternity on that, why in the world would I doubt that God would answer my prayer? Why would I doubt? You and I are to walk in confidence. Listen, not in anything you and I manufacture, not in anything we come up with. We're to walk in absolute confidence, unshakable faith in God who never changes. So what I want you to ask yourself is this. Is your life really governed by faith, by confidence in Him? Have you really put your faith and your confidence in Him that whatever He says, He's going to do? Sometimes we have to wait longer than we want to wait. Sometimes He says He's going to do something, and, and He doesn't do it on our schedule, so we doubt that he, he said it, doubt that He meant it, or doubt that we're worthy of it, or doubt that, that we have all kinds of doubts. What happens is we cannot enjoy life if we're governed and dominated by doubt. And you let your focus get off of God and look at circumstances and the way people operate and the things they do and the way they treat you and what they say, and you, you will doubt. If you focus and, and listen, fasten your focus upon God, it doesn't make any difference what's going on. Waves can hit you, tornadoes, hurricanes, you name it, what happens? Something stabilizes your feet to the immovable rock who is almighty God. And what is it? It is the word of the living God. Thanks for joining us today for In Touch with Dr. Charles Stanley. His message on overcoming doubt continues tomorrow. If you struggle with doubt, search the scriptures for passages that relate to your questions. Read what God's Word says and believe it. 
rejecting anything that contradicts the truth. Are you determined to grow in your knowledge of God? We'd like to help. Browse our website, intouch.org, for devotions, Bible-based study tools, and relevant articles that offer you the assurance to believe that the Lord is trustworthy. And that's where you can order a copy of today's complete message, The Struggle with Doubt. It's also included in our teaching set, Winning Over Life Struggles. Again, that's intouch.org or call 1-800-IN-TOUCH. You can write to us at In Touch, Post Office Box 7900, Atlanta, Georgia, 30357. As Christ lives His life through you, His impact will be noticed. A reminder for believers is coming up in today's Moment with Charles Stanley. Does your prayer life need a jump start? With the In Touch Praying with Purpose cards, the time you spend talking with God will take on a whole new level of energy and intimacy. Beautifully designed and easy to use or to share with a friend, there are prayers to lift up each day of the month along with corresponding Bible verses and more. For your set of Praying with Purpose cards, call 1-800-IN-TOUCH or go to intouch.org slash store. With the 30 Life Principles Bible Study, you'll enjoy a rich exploration of God's Word. Designed as a 90-day learning experience for individual use or in a group setting, you'll explore Dr. Stanley's 30 Life Principles and learn how to make the Bible a part of your everyday life because we can all benefit from a closer look. To order the 30 Life Principles Bible Study, call 1-800-IN-TOUCH or visit intouch.org slash store. If you're a believer, then Jesus is in you. That means your life should be an expression of God's love. Here's a moment with Charles Stanley. It is the purpose and the plan of Jesus Christ that leaving you here on earth, He intends that your conversation, your character, and your conduct in mind would be such that people will be pointed to Him by looking at us. Have there not been those who came up to you and said, you know, there's something about you that's different. I don't know what it is, but I'm going through a difficult time in my life, and maybe you can help me. You know why they say that to you? Because they have seen something of the image of Christ within you. There's a compassion. There's a sensitivity. There's a wisdom. There's a willingness. There's an encouragement. There's a joy. There's a hope. There's a peace. There's something in you they cannot understand. They don't know what it is. You and I know what it is. That isn't just us trying to live the Christian life. That is Jesus Christ expressing, listen, expressing Him self through us. Learn more about reaching out to others with the love of Christ at intouch.org. If you missed any of today's message, or if you'd like to hear it again, visit our website. You can also stream previous messages from the audio archives or download a variety of podcasts. Find these and many other resources at intouch.org. And if today's program has encouraged you to become the person God intends you to be, we'd love to hear from you. Insecurity can sneak into our lives at any time, but we don't have to live with it. Tomorrow, we wrap up our series on winning over life struggles with three steps for overcoming doubt. I hope you'll join us Thursday for In Touch with Dr. Charles Stanley. This program is a presentation of In Touch Ministries, Atlanta, Georgia, and remains on this station through the grace of God and your faithful prayers and gifts. You see, God is a good God. He wants His children delighted with Him, not discouraged. And doubt creates all kinds of discouragement in every single area of life. It doesn't fit who we are. It is a consequence of our doubt. You need to get it out of your life. It doesn't belong to a child of God. Romans chapter 8 says, There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But do you still wonder if you're really forgiven? If your spiritual life is plagued with doubts, you can learn to trust the Lord consistently and walk in faith. Today on In Touch with Dr. Charles Stanley, we conclude his series, Winning Over Life Struggles, 
by learning how believers overcome the struggle with doubt. How many times have you gotten on your knees and told the Lord what your need was, and you know in your heart that He says He'll supply all of your needs, and then you walked away thinking, well, I certainly hope so. Or maybe you have found some promise in the Word of God that relates to exactly what you've been praying about. And so you read the promise, you believed exactly what it said, and the next day you're thinking, well, I hope so. I'm not sure. Doubting God for this, doubting God for the other, and doubting oftentimes yourself. And that's what I want to talk about in this message in our series on winning over those situations and circumstances in life that cause us trouble. So we call them winning over the struggles of life. So I want you to turn, if you will, to James chapter 1. James chapter 1, verse, beginning in verse 2. He says, Now consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all men generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him or to her. But let him ask in faith without any doubting, for the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man expect that he will receive anything from the Lord, being a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. So let's look at this passage now for a few moments and think in terms of what is the character of a doubter? For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. Let not that man or that woman expect to receive anything from the Lord, being a double-minded man or woman, a person, unstable in all their ways. Now, what is he saying? First of all, he says, those people who come to God, who are doubters, they're unsuccessful in their prayer life. Now, here's what he says. Look, it couldn't be any clearer. He says, let him or her ask in faith without any doubting. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven by the winds and tossed. Let not that person think or believe they're going to receive anything from God. Why? Here's the reason. He says they're like the waves of the sea, up and down, up and down, up and down. Now, when a person's living like that, they're living like the person they're not if they're saved. When you not trusted Jesus Christ as our Savior, we believe the witness of God about His Son. You and I have said we're willing to believe the Word of God, this book right here. In fact, we believe it to the most critical, crucial test, that, that the moment I know I'm my, my heart's going to beat the last time and I'm going to die, I'm going to die with absolute confidence that the moment I die, I'm going to be in the presence of God. How do I know that? Nobody has ever come back and told me I've never gotten any word from heaven, some audible voice of somebody who's up there. The only reason I believe that and the only reason you and I are absolutely fearless of death is because we read it in the Word of God. So what I want you to ask yourself is this. Is your life really governed by faith, by confidence in Him? Have you really put your faith and your confidence in Him that whatever He says, He's going to do? Sometimes we have to wait longer than we want to wait. Sometimes He says He's going to do something and, and He doesn't do it on our schedule, so we doubt that he, he said it, doubt that He meant it, or doubt that we're worthy of it, or doubt that, that we have all kinds of doubts. What happens is we cannot enjoy life if we're governed and dominated by doubt. And you let your focus get off of God and look at circumstances and the way people operate and the things they do and the way they treat you and what they say, and you, you will doubt. If you focus and, and listen, fasten your focus upon God, it doesn't make any difference what's going on. Waves can hit you, tornadoes, hurricanes, you name it, what happens? Something stabilizes your feet to the immovable rock who is almighty God. And what is it? It is the word of the living God. So you don't want to be uncertain, unstable, and, as he says here, unsuccessful. Now, what are the consequences of living in that kind of doubt? And see, sometimes it's our misunderstanding that causes us to doubt. Doubt has no place in the life of the believer unless it is the Holy Spirit throwing up a road barrier in front of us to say, wrong direction, wrong direction, turn around and go. This is the direction of God. Otherwise, doubt does not fit us, doesn't suit us, and is doing us absolutely no good. Now, what are the consequences of doubt? Number one, our relationship to God. 
You cannot have the right relationship to God and doubt Him. It just doesn't work because, you see, He says we're, we're to live by faith, we're to walk by faith. In fact, He says you can't even please Him otherwise. Hebrews, He says, those of us who come to God must believe that He is and that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. He says, I want you to come to me. I want you to believe in me, and I want you to believe that I'm going to reward you. I'm going to diligently reward you for diligently seeking me and asking me. So, the whole issue here is our relationship with God is going to be affected. Now, certainly, the second consequence is our prayer life. And I want you to go back, if you will, to Matthew chapter 21 for a moment. Matthew chapter 21, beginning in verse 18. He says, now, in the morning when he returned to the city, he became hungry, talking about Jesus. And seeing a lone fig tree by the road, he came to it and found nothing on it except leaves only. And he said to it, speaking to the tree now, no longer shall there ever be any fruit from you. And at once the fig tree withered. And seeing this, the disciples marveled, saying, how did the fig tree wither at once? How did that happen? Now, Jesus never took a moment to explain how. That wasn't even the issue here. Now, look what happens. He says, And Jesus answered and said to them, Truly I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you shall not only do what was done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, Be taken up and cast into the sea, it shall happen, and all things you ask in prayer believing, you shall receive. Now, let's think about this for a moment. Uh, he's talking about the Mount of Olives, and he's talking about taking up the Mount of Olives and casting it into the Dead Sea. Well, was Jesus talking about taking Mount, the Mount of Olives and throwing it into the sea? No, he was not. What he was saying is this. If you believe God and do not doubt him, you will have the privilege of experiencing the power of God in your life to do things that absolutely, humanly speaking, are impossible. That is, the impossible becomes possible to those who believe God and do not doubt. He's simply saying, no task in harmony with the will of God is impossible to perform to those who do not doubt. No task, no task within the will of God is impossible to perform to those who do not doubt. And so, what he's saying here is this. It is doubt that short-circuits our faith that causes our prayers to become null and void. And if you and I get on our face before God and we begin to pray and we do not, we do not believe what we're asking, we don't believe He's going to answer our prayer, we, we might as well just shut up and walk away. Because here's what He says in this passage. He says, Let not that man or woman expect that he will receive, listen, anything from the Lord. He says, Doubt cancels out your prayer that when you pray and you're doubting God, it's not going to work. But one of the consequences is our prayer life absolutely goes haywire. A third thing that happens is this. Our service to God becomes greatly hindered. God has never raised up an area of service, a need in any church that he didn't have somebody to meet that need. And so when people say, well, you know, I just don't think I can. What I want you to ask yourself is this, not can you, but, but can God enable you to successfully and do well what he's called you to do? And every single one of us would agree, yes, he can. But well, then if he can and he's spoken to your heart, then why do you not do what God called you to do? The issue is, what's the will of God? To my knowledge, there's not a single verse in the scripture that God says, I'm looking for perfect men and women. When I look in the Scriptures, he takes the most honorary crowd and does what? He uses them and molds them and makes them amidst their failures and their sins and all their difficulties. And what do we do? We're here praising them thousands of years of later, not because they were perfect, not because they didn't make mistakes, not because they didn't ever doubt God, but because they, by a bad lifestyle, they did put their faith and trust in him. Now, does that mean that I'm to never doubt? All of us are going to get in situations where we think, God, what's going to happen? And we begin to look at the circumstance, weigh the circumstance, forget who he is, forget the awesome power of God, the omnipotence of God, which is available to every single believer, and we have our moments of doubt. But listen, for the believer, doubt should be just about that fast. And then we remember who God is, remember where he is, remember what he's called us to do, and remember what he's promised to be in every single one of us. Doubt does not fit who we are. 
The consequences are devastating to the work of God. Another consequence is this. It's devastating to the blessings of God. Listen, if he says, if ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it, which means, of course, if it's in his name, it's in his will. And he says in 1 John chapter 5, we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. If we know that he hears us, we know that we have the petition we desired of him. And so you think about all, listen, think about all the things you can ask for, all the things that God wants you to ask for. God wants to bless his children. He says, let not that man think that he is going to receive anything from the Lord if he asks doubting. What do we do? We cheat ourselves out of the blessings of God. God wants to bless his children. Listen, it's no honor to God to keep his children uh, dismayed and discouraged and down in the dumps and, and living like paupers. God wants his children blessed because God wants to say to an unbelieving world, listen, that he is a good God. He is a gracious God. He is a generous God. He's a loving God. He's a caring God. He's a merciful God. He's a tender God. He's this wonderful, wonderful heavenly father that we have. But if I live in doubt and question God and miss out on the blessings of God, not only have I hurt myself, I have also hurt God in the fact that he wants to speak to somebody else through me, but I am unwilling to trust him so he can bless me so God can speak to someone else. And it's not that I'm being critical. I, I feel compassionately, deeply grieved when I see people hurt and missing the blessings of God and missing out what God wants to do in their life simply because they doubt. And ultimately, it all boils down to, is God truthful or is he not? And the Word of God tells me that he is because I've never found a thing in there, not a single promise that he didn't keep when he made it. Well, one of the primary results, of course, is discouragement. You can't live in doubt and be encouraged. You can't live in doubt and be happy. You can't live in doubt and be joyous. You can't live in doubt and have peace and contentment. You're going to be discouraged. Because you see, you're going to face situations and circumstances, you're going to think, what shall I do? And you know, all of us have had people that have come to us, and when I say these things, I don't mean to be critical, I'm just illustrating, because we've all done it ourselves. And uh, we've said, well, what do you think I should do? And somebody tells you exactly what to do, and you walk away saying, well, I'll think about it. Well, think about it, just do what's right. And you see, sometimes you, just, you, you can't live by your feelings. Feelings are devastating to faith. You see, God is a good God. He wants his children delighted with him, not discouraged. And doubt creates all kinds of discouragement in every single area of life. It doesn't fit who we are. It is a consequence of our doubt. Now, the ultimate question is how do we cure it? I want to mention three things that I think will be helpful, and everybody has to relate this to their own life. One of the primary things that I, I think is helpful is this, and that is to identify what's the cause of my doubt. What's the source of it? Is it because I don't believe the Word of God? Is it because I've, I've been taught things that are not true? Is it because somewhere along the way, as somebody said, well, you, you can trust God sometime, but some things are just different? And, or is it because there's sin in my life? That is, what's the source of my doubt? That's number one. The second one is this. Recall some past instance or experiences in your life where you did trust God. You put your faith in Him and remember what He did. Recall past experiences when you did put your faith in Him, you did trust Him, you did believe Him, you were confident in Him, and what did He do? And then the third one is this one, the most important of all. If I could tell you today just one thing, if I could say to you as a believer, if I could only tell you one thing to do in your Christian life, just one, and you would do that one thing above everything else in this book, here's what I tell you to do. Look, if you will. Verse 7, Joshua chapter 1. Only be strong and very courageous. Be careful to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left so that you may have success wherever you go. Listen, Joshua. This book of the law, for us it would be the whole Bible today, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. Then you'll make your way prosperous, and then you'll have success. But look in verse 9. Have I not commanded you to be strong and courageous? Do not tremble or be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Listen, that verse wouldn't even count if verse 
7 and 8 were not there. That is, meditating upon the Word of God. So what would I say? If I can only say one thing to a believer, just one thing, here's what I'd say. If you can only do one thing in your Christian life, here's what you do. You get in this book every day. You get on your knees before God. And not only read the Word of God, meditate upon it. Think about it. Ask God what He's saying to you. Lord, speak to my heart about this. How, how does this apply to my life? What's going to happen in my life today that you brought me to this passage? Show me what it means. Show me how to apply it in my life in a way that best suits what you have in store for me, your will for my life. You know what you're doing? You program, listen, you program your mind to think the way God thinks. There is nothing so helpful in, in energizing our faith, strengthening our faith, and destroying doubt is getting on your knees in the Word of God. You say, well, you don't have to be on your knees. No, you don't. You can sit in a chair, but I want to tell you something. There is something, there is something about getting on your knees before Almighty God and acknowledging who you are in the light of who Almighty, Sovereign, Holy, Eternal God is. We're talking about Holy, Eternal God who has this, listen, who has this awesome sense of indescribable power, but who is so meticulously, personally interested in you. If you want to get rid of doubt, you want to anchor your soul to something that is absolutely immovable, he's it. And the way to get rid of doubt is to get in this book and to begin to meditate, read it, think about it, Pray over it. Pray it back to him. Tell him what he said. Ask him to show you how it applies to your life. You know what's going to happen? I don't care what you're facing in life. And friend, I've been through more battles and more storms and heartaches and burdens and persecutions and trials. And I'm here to tell you what kept me afloat every single time was just one thing, that book right there. That will keep you afloat when all hell breaks loose against you. That will keep you afloat. You want to get rid of doubt? Get in the book. And something will happen to your doubts, and you'll be freed. And Father, we love you and praise you and bless you and honor you and exalt you and lift you up. Thank you for this precious Word, the Word of God, the eternal, infallible, inerrant Word that you've given to us. I pray today that every single one of us will examine our heart and to see what we are missing because of doubt. I pray for someone who is unsaved, who's doubted that you would save them who's thought in their heart they've been too mean, too bad, too evil for too long, that you said in your word, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, period, not depending on how long they've been bad, what they've done, but just calling out of mercy to you. I pray, Lord, for those in churches all over this nation who ought to be in service to you, service in their church, serving you, honoring you, expressing their gifts and talents, to, but because of their doubt, my God, I pray in Jesus' name, bring down such deep conviction upon them, such conviction, dear God, that it's sin to disobey you and conviction that you will be the person in them that you promised to be. I pray your power might be upon them, that with freedom and liberty they'd step out today to say, Lord, I'm going to obey you no matter what. For we ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. You're listening to In Touch with Dr. Charles Stanley. The key to overcoming doubt is to spend time each day meditating on and absorbing God's Word. As you become familiar with who the Lord is, your uncertainty will be replaced with strong faith that He will help you withstand waves of doubt. If you need help developing a lifestyle of trusting God, browse our many helpful resources at intouch.org. And if you go to the bookstore page, you can order a copy of Dr. Stanley's complete message, The Struggle with Doubt, or order his teaching set titled, Winning Over Life Struggles. Again, you'll find these resources at intouch.org or call 1-800-IN-TOUCH. To write to us, address your letter to In Touch, Post Office Box 7900, Atlanta, Georgia, 30357. You'll hear more thoughts on the source of a believer's confident assurance coming up in today's Moment with Charles Stanley.
At In Touch Ministries, we're committed to providing you with sound, biblically based content to help you grow in your walk with the Lord. And with your feedback, we're always seeking ways to improve the resources you've been enjoying for years. In January, we launched our updated monthly devotional featuring larger, easier to read text, Sunday reflections, Bible studies, and inspiring stories, all in a new, refreshed design. Subscribe for free today at intouch.org slash devotional. When my daughter was two months old, she was diagnosed with a terminal illness. I would pray and ask God if he would heal her. In the midst of suffering, how do we know what God's will is for our life? God's will for your life doesn't have to remain a mystery. Learn how to understand and pursue God's ultimate plan for your life in Dr. Charles Stanley's new book, The Will of God. To order, visit intouch.org slash willofgod. A believer's stability goes hand in hand with confidence in the Word of God. Here's a moment with Charles Stanley. The inerrant, infallible Word of God. You and I have based our whole eternity on what is written in ink on these white pages. Now, why in the world would I doubt that God would answer my prayer? Why would I doubt? You see, you say, well, if, if God doesn't always answer our prayers the way we want to, well, there's a reason for that. Sometimes we're out of God's will. Sometimes we're asking for the wrong thing, and sometimes it's not God's time. So there is a reason if God delays and the reason is not in us, it's because God is working out something. That is, if we're walking in the will of God, asking the will of God, and God is withholding the answer, God is up to something, listen, bigger than I'm asking for, greater than I'm asking for, and far more rewarding and far more rejoicing than I could ever imagine in this little thing that I'm asking for. And so there are reasons that we feel the way we feel, and the very character of a doubt is they're unsuccessful, uncertain, and unstable. Decisive, listen, That's what the Word of God does. It makes us decisive. We can find in the Scriptures, here's what we ought to do, here's how we ought to respond, and that's the way I'm going to respond. That's what gives us determination and confidence and assurance and being able to hang in there and to be resolute. When everything around us and everybody's around us is saying, well, you ought to do this and you ought to do that, what does the Word of God say? This Bible is the anchor to the sons and daughters of God who believe Him. But if you doubt it, then what happens? Then he says, you're going to be unstable in all your ways. You and I are to walk in confidence. Listen, not in anything you and I manufacture, not in anything we come up with. We're to walk in absolute confidence, unshakable faith in God who never changes. You can be more certain of truth when you know more about the Lord. You'll find resources to help you study God at intouch.org. Would you like to hear today's message again? You can stream it on our website or download podcasts and take In Touch with you. Our web address again is intouch.org. And if God has worked in your life through today's program, please share your story with us. Do you feel like you're just not up to the task in front of you? That can be a healthy perspective. Learn more about the good side of inadequacy. Friday on In Touch with Dr. Charles Stanley. This program is a presentation of In Touch Ministries, Atlanta, Georgia, and remains on this station through the grace of God and your faithful prayers and gifts. How much was I supposed to read the Bible? I'll tell you how much I can always conclude it, a little bit more than I did. How many people should I witness to? Surely far more than I did. And so there's a sense of guilt. It's sort of in the air. It's the climate. It's the environment. Satan uses false guilt to harass God's people. Look at you. You could have done better. Any feeling of guilt that does not have a biblical basis to it is false guilt. You're not going to see God heaping guilt on His children anywhere in the Word of God. It's not there. Welcome to In Touch with Dr. Charles Stanley. We're glad you've joined us. Are you guilty or does it just feel that way? There's a big difference. Learn how Christ resolves real guilt and can also deal with those lingering guilty feelings too. Find lasting peace as you listen to today's message on overcoming the struggle with guilt. What do you experience when you have feelings of guilt? Now, more than likely, 
We could ask many people that question and get lots of answers, but sometimes a person says, well, I have a feeling of dread. Uh, something bad is going to happen when I feel guilty, or I feel unworthy, or I, I feel dirty, I feel stained. Uh, somehow I feel like a failure. So there are lots of feelings people have when they have feelings of guilt. So what I want to do in this message entitled, because of our series entitled Winning Over the Struggles of Life, this one is entitled Winning Over Our Struggle with Guilt. I want us to look at the three types of guilt that we have to deal with in life and how we respond, because if we don't understand that there's more than one type, then we'll treat them all the same. But first of all, I want to give you a definition of guilt. And if you may just want to jot this down, it might be simple for you to uh, go back and look at it. But guilt is a sense of wrongdoing. It is a sense of wrongdoing and emotional conflict that arises out of having second thoughts on something we've done. It is a sense of wrongdoing and emotional conflict that it rises out of second thoughts on something that we have done. And all of us, when we think about what guilt is, it is because we think about something that has happened in the past or even we thought something that happened in the past or we thought that we had done wrong or maybe we did. But it is born out of second thoughts on that. You may look back in your life and see something that you have done and you have asked the Lord to forgive you and He has forgiven you. If you keep bringing up old trash and you keep feeling guilty over something that God has forgiven you for, that is false guilt. Oftentimes, false guilt is primarily those things and feelings that we have that we can't really even identify, but yet the feeling of guilt is there. So, with that in mind, I want us to look at this whole idea. And I want you to turn, if you will, to 1 John chapter 1. And I want us to read a couple of verses here because... Herein lies, I believe, one of the key verses in the Scripture about our ability not to feel guilty. Now, if I should ask you, does God promote in the Scriptures that His children should feel guilty? And the answer is no. In fact, the word's not found very many times in the Bible. In fact, in the Gospels, most of the times it is Pilate referring to Jesus that he can't find any guilt in Christ. But look, if you will, at these verses. Beginning in verse 5 of this first chapter, he says... And this is the message we have heard from him and announced to you, that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all, no sin. If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his Son cleanses us from all sin. Now, I want you to go back to Ephesians chapter 1 for a moment, and we'll come back to this verse in a little while. But in Ephesians chapter 1, as Paul has been talking about how blessed we are and how God has chosen us, he comes to the seventh verse, and here's what he says, speaking of the Lord Jesus. He says, in Him that is in Christ, we have redemption, that is our salvation, through His blood, that is the work of the cross, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to to the riches of His grace, which He lavished upon us, not according to our conduct, not because of our behavior, but He says we have forgiveness because of His grace, the riches of His grace toward us, which He's lavished upon us. Now, with that in mind, I want us to look for just a moment and examine uh, why we feel guilty. That is, what causes us to have uh, false guilt, psychological guilt? Well, I think one of the primary reasons is this. We have been taught wrongly. And uh, if you grew up in a church that is very legalistic and uh, has lots of rules and regulations and you must do this and you must not do that, what will happen is it creates an atmosphere of false guilt. If I grow up thinking that everything is wrong, then I'm going to have a sense of guilt. And it is a false sense of guilt. God did not mean to take all the pleasures out of life. And so, therefore, if we grow up thinking that this is wrong and that is wrong, and if you don't read the Bible a certain amount every week, and if you don't pray a certain amount, and if you don't witness to us, uh, and if you don't give so much, that is, I could heap up a great heap of legalism right here this morning by saying, you know, about how much you read the Bible, how much you pray. Well, let me ask you, how much should you read the Bible? How much should you pray? How often should you witness? That is, nobody can answer that for someone else. 
and to place those kind of uh, rules and regulations on people causes great uh, uh, guilt in their life. And, so, and I, I can tell you that that's the way I sort of grew up. How much was I supposed to read the Bible? I'll tell you how much I always concluded, a little bit more than I did. How much more should I pray? A little more than I prayed. How many people should I witness to? Surely far more than I did. And so there's a sense of guilt. It's sort of in the air. It's the climate. It's the environment. A second reason I believe that we have that is because of childhood memories. There are people who have been abused sexually or they've been abused uh, uh, physically in some fashion or verbally. And so they grew up feeling guilty because somewhere in their family, someone said, well, if you'd have been what you ought to have been, that wouldn't have happened to you or things wouldn't be the way they are if you'd have done so and so. And so they just have this sense of guilt. Well, they must be guilty. It must be their fault. Why? They can't tell you anything they did. They can't tell you anything that they chose. It was no sin on their part. It was something that somebody heaped on them. And so they live with a sense of guilt, a sense that you have either done something wrong or you are wrong. God would never tell you as a believer through the Holy Spirit that you're wrong. He may say, this is wrong in your life and this needs to be corrected, but he's never going to say, you're bad, you're wrong. So oftentimes it is childhood experiences. Sometimes it is a matter of our perfectionism. And there are lots of people who have a very, very perfectionistic personality. That is, they have high expectations. There's nothing wrong with having high expectations as long as they are realistic, as long as they fit God's will for your life, and as long as they fit your capabilities and talents and abilities. But when a person has expectations of themselves that are far beyond what they are physically or God-given talents are capable of achieving, what they do is they always feel guilty. I could have done better. I should have done better. Perfectionism, trying to live up to expectations that God would never place on anybody. Another reason is because a person oftentimes has a low sense of self-esteem. They just sort of feel like that they didn't get the breaks in life and uh, they don't feel like somebody. They feel like they're a little less than they ought to be. Uh, not quite up to par. What's par? They can't tell you that. Well, how much better do they, do they want to be? They can't even tell you that. Uh, they should weigh a little less, be a little tall, look a little better, hair should be different. That is, there's always something that they can find that causes them to feel inadequate. And so as a result, uh, no matter what they do, they don't ever quite feel like they've done it exactly right. Listen, anything, any feeling of guilt, now listen to this, any feeling of guilt, that does not have a biblical basis to it is false guilt. It is false. It is not God-given guilt. You're not going to see God heaping guilt on His children anywhere in the Word of God. It's not there. And so when you look at the reasons, for example, that uh, people feel guilty uh, psychologically, what you and I can say is that uh, anything that uh, we feel guilty about if it's a sin that we have already confessed and repented of and Satan's hashing it up again, false guilt, we're no longer guilty. Any of these attitudes and feelings that we have that we can't put our finger on biblically, it's false guilt. Scratch it, it's not real. And so what happens is this. Satan uses false guilt to harass God's people. Well, you should have. You ought. You must. Look at you. You could have done better. Is that all you read the Bible? If you think about all the reasons that for which people feel guilty, for believers, about 90% of it is false guilt. They cannot tell you exactly why they feel guilty. Now, friend, that's false. It is not of God, and He does not want us having those feelings. And so those kind of feelings do not fit who we are. So when you look at the reasons for our guilt, there is that psychological guilt, that's false guilt. Now, what about biblical guilt? Well, biblical guilt is this. It is this feeling that I have, this anxiety in my spirit over a definite, deliberate, that is a willful sin. That is, biblical guilt is the result of committing an act of sin. Now, no time in the Bible is, does we find the Holy Spirit talking about you're bad or you're evil. The Spirit of God convicts us of specific sins. If I have gossiped about someone, if I have stolen something, lied, or committed some act, some violation of Scripture, the Holy Spirit never does say, you're just bad. The Holy Spirit says, that is a sin. The Holy Spirit says, you know you shouldn't have done that. And God always, through His Spirit, identifies what we have done so that our guilty feelings, when they are based on the Scriptures, it is something definitely we can deal with. 
So biblical guilt is guilt based on a specific violation of the Word of God, and it is to be dealt with as sin, not some hazy, foggy something out yonder that you cannot identify and cannot understand. Now, what we have to ask is this. What is the result of these guilty feelings in our life? Now, here's what I want you to remember. It doesn't make any difference whether your guilt is false or whether it's true guilt. False guilt leaves the same effect upon us as true guilt does. Now, why? Why, 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 and what are the results? What happens in a person's life? One of the first things that happens in a person's life when they begin to feel guilty is doubt. In the life of the believer, one of the things that happens is doubt. What do we doubt when we are feeling guilty? Well, we doubt whether God loves us or not. We doubt God's presence. Uh, we doubt God's provision for us. We doubt the promises of God. One of the things that we doubt and you think about this, when you have sinned and you know you have or you're feeling guilty and you get down to pray, what happens? You have a very difficult struggle with believing that God is going to answer your prayer if you are overwhelmed with a sense of guilt. If Satan is harassing you and bringing up your past and, and badgering you with your past and you're down asking God to do something for you, it is very difficult to have a sense of faith. And so we doubt. Then there is fear. What guilt does, it brings upon us fear, fear of the judgment of God, a fear of God's disapproval, a fear of God's rejection of us, fear that we'll be found out for something in the past, fear of loss, fear of loss of health, fear of loss of your financial security, but fear, 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 and guilt go hand in hand. Fear is always a result. Then there is the desire for punishment. You remember when you were raising your children and, and they would just keep on doing wrong and keep on doing wrong until finally you gave them a good spanking. What happened? I mean, it's like they said, Whew, took me a whole lot of wrongdoing to finally get a spanking because they felt better after they were spanked because they knew they deserved it. And so a desire for punishment. Then one of the results of guilt is this. Insecurity is certainly one of the results of feeling guilty. Insecurity, you know what happens? A person never feels secure about anything. They, they never have quite enough money. They don't have enough friends. No matter how well their friends may approve of them, they haven't said quite enough. And so there's just this overwhelming sense of insecurity for which they cannot put their finger on it. And they can come up with something, well, I need more money when they don't. Well, I need more of this, I need more of that. Well, if, if this were true and that were true, well, I'm afraid I'm going to get sick. Well, you know, you and I could work up a nervous breakdown in a few minutes if we just let our thinking, if we turn our thinking over to the devil because he is going to cloud you with every way he possibly can. Now, feelings of inadequacy. Then there's compulsive behavior. A person, for example, who feels guilty, oftentimes, how do they respond? They just get busy and stay busy. Busy, 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 busy. Why? Because they are trying oftentimes to pay God back. Now, they don't even realize that often. They're trying to pay God back, trying to work up some kind of divine approval. Listen, when you trust that Jesus Christ is your personal Savior, you have all the approval you'll ever get from God. He approves of you not because of your conduct and behavior, but because you're one of His children. And so when we think about how this works in our life, it, it brings upon us all kinds of pain. and all, It's emotional pain. And so we feel this compulsive behavior. There are men and women in the ministry who are in the ministry because of their past, because they think their past is so bad that somehow they've got to pay God back. Now, what's the best way, humanly thinking, to pay God back? Get in the ministry, preach the gospel, go to the mission field, sacrifice for God, or do something uh, that would cause them to feel like that they are serving God, working, getting God's approval, and paying God off for forgiving them because of their sin. Listen, you can't pay God off. How in the world are you going to repay God for your sin? How, how long are you going to have to work? How diligent are you going to have to be? How much are you going to have to sacrifice? Making amends for wrongs done, that's one thing. Getting into the ministry to pay God back and to work and to sacrifice and burn yourself out to prove to God that you're worthy of salvation, never, 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 never. But that is one of the awful results of guilt. And that is a person tries to do something that they're absolutely, it's impossible to do. Then one of the results of guilt is this, the inability to experience the pleasures of life. Now, I can remember coming along, and for a long time, this is certainly one of the things that Satan clouded me with. I felt like as a pastor, if I were not preaching 
or praying or studying the Word of God, if I were not witnessing or doing something in the church, that I was guilty. Now, guilty of what? I couldn't tell you what it was. It's just that I felt like being called of God. You know, I had to be busy doing something for the Lord 24 hours a day. Now, I knew I couldn't do it 24 hours a day. And you see, the idea of being burned out, sacrificed for God, just burn out for Jesus. Well, nothing could be further from the truth than that. I had to get over the fact that I couldn't even enjoy life for the pressure of thinking I ought to be doing this and ought to be doing that. Listen, should oughts and musts will drive you into the ground. No one in the Bible does he say, Christians should live under this, should oughts and must. Now, another result is the physical results, and that is people can work themselves to death and get themselves physically in such a state of worrying and fretting and fear over what they don't have and what may happen in their life until physically they can get into states of depression, they can get discouraged, they can physically begin to be ill. And this is the thing that's so subtle about false guilt, you can't identify it. That is, unless somebody instruction tells you how. How do you identify these things? And this is the reason we said in the very beginning, one of the reasons that people uh, feel guilty is wrong teaching. And when people have been taught wrongly, they feel guilty. And think about, I think about going through life the way I began and feeling guilty about things. I'm not giving God enough time and not doing this and not doing that. That is all false guilt. And the results of that guilt in our life, physically, emotionally, and mentally can absolutely destroy a person. And listen, you can go to the doctor and he can give you all kinds of prescriptions and all kinds of pills, but until you deal with the issue, all you'll do is become an addict. Listen, pills do not alleviate guilt. It takes more than some prescription. It takes a relationship with Jesus Christ. It takes a proper understanding of what guilt is all about and how we ought to be dealing with this guilt. You may be one of those persons over which guilt has just hovered. I mean, it's just sort of hovered over you. And all of a sudden, when you begin to affirm, I'm somebody special, made in the likeness of my Lord. I'm somebody who's truly loved, loved by God. I'm someone who's been forgiven. And if I'm forgiven, then what's all this guilty feeling? Where's all this coming from? It's not coming from God. And if it's not coming from God, it's coming from the devil. Then reject it. You simply say, in the name of the Lord Jesus, I reject these feelings of guilt. They have no biblical basis. Therefore, it's false, it's a lie, and I refuse to acknowledge it. And you know what will happen? The cloud's going to disappear. You know why? Because it has no basis, and you have put it on the run because you have responded to false guilt in the proper fashion. You have affirmed who you are, special in the eyes of God. You're affirmed how He looks upon you, that He loves you. You're affirmed of what He's done for you. He has forgiven you, and therefore, a forgiven child of God has no reason to feel guilty. He says, if we walk in the light, is He in the light? And all of us who are believers are doing that. Does that mean we're sinless? No. Make no mistakes? No. Are we stumbling at times? Yes. Forgiven? Absolutely. The blood of His Son, Jesus Christ, is continually present tense, continually doing what? Forgiving, wiping out, and making us pure in the eyes of God. Thanks for joining us on In Touch with Dr. Charles Stanley. His message on winning the struggle with guilt continues tomorrow. Remember that God loves you unconditionally and does not intend for you to live with feelings of false guilt. That's why the Holy Spirit points out specific sin so that we can confess and repent. To learn more about the freedom Jesus offers, stop by our website, intouch.org. You'll find solid biblical answers to common questions about the Bible and living the Christian life. And to order a copy of Dr. Stanley's complete message, The Struggle with Guilt, visit our online bookstore. It's also included in his teaching set, Winning Over Life Struggles. Again, log on to intouch.org or call 1-800-IN-TOUCH. To write to us, address your letter to In Touch, Post Office Box 7900, Atlanta, Georgia, 30357. The book of Ephesians describes Christians as God's masterpieces. If you've ever had a hard time believing that about yourself, stay with us for today's Moment with Charles Stanley. It's coming up. We all want to be blessed, but what does being blessed mean to you? Things, family, happiness? 
No matter what we do, where we go, what we achieve, we always want more, don't we? More time, more money, more peace. We chase after a blessed life, but the problem is our culture makes it difficult to know what being blessed is all about. Jesus made it all clear when he gave his Sermon on the Mount in the Gospel of Matthew. He described a life that doesn't depend on your bank account, where you live or work, or what you own. It's a life that rests not on external circumstances, but on the interior condition of the heart. It's a life that's richer and fuller than anything this world could ever match. Join us for Blessed to Be, our year-long focus on the Beatitudes, and experience the life you were truly meant to live. Discover more at intouch.org slash blessed. That's intouch.org slash blessed. God made each of us unique. How special are you? Here's a moment with Charles Stanley. If you're a believer, you're somebody special. Well, what's special about me? Why am I special? Because of my talents and abilities and gifts? No. Why am I special? Here's one reason I'm special. I'm the only one of my kind (laughs) in the whole world. You're the only one of your kind. You say, well, other people like me, name them. Tell me somebody exactly like you. God didn't make two people exactly alike. Twins may be twins, but they're not exactly alike. You're the only person of your kind. Nobody's exactly like you. How special are you? He said, I have predestined. I've determined beforehand that I'm going to conform you into the likeness of my son. Now, I may have to put sandpaper on you, and I may have to put a chisel on you, and I may have to put a saw on you, but whatever it takes, I'm going to make you just like my son. Now, listen, his son was perfect because his son was God. You're so special that God has predestined every single one of us to become like his son. Now, friend, tell me, how much more special can you be? There's not a position, there's not enough wealth, there's not enough recognition, there's not enough anything to equal your being special compared to what God has done to make you special. No one is excluded from God's love. If you humbly ask Him to forgive you through faith in His Son, Jesus Christ, He will erase your debt of sin and adopt you into His family. Then, as a believer, you can begin to understand who you are in Christ. Learn more at intouch.org. If you'd like to hear today's message again, you'll find it on our website, plus an entire library of messages in our audio archives. You can also download podcasts and take In Touch along with you. Our web address again is intouch.org. And if you are encouraged and equipped today to boldly live out your faith in Christ, we'd love to hear your story. Is it your habit to condemn yourself for things you've done? Tomorrow, we'll learn to truly accept God's forgiveness as our series, Winning Over Life Struggles, continues. That's Wednesday on In Touch with Dr. Charles Stanley. This program is a presentation of In Touch Ministries, Atlanta, Georgia, and remains on this station through the grace of God and your faithful prayers and gifts. Truth is the only thing that sets us free. Truth is the only thing that liberates us from satanic harassment. Satan says, you mean to tell me that you think after what you've done that all you have to do is to get on your knees and ask your Heavenly Father to forgive you of that sin as wicked and as vile and as atrocious as it was? You mean to tell me that you think God's going to forgive you simply because you ask Him? And Satan, the answer is yes. Why? Because God said so, period. And that's all it needs. Welcome to In Touch with Dr. Charles Stanley. God forgives anyone who comes to Him through faith in Jesus Christ. Once we have His pardon from the penalty of sin, we can understand our need to extend forgiveness to others. And today we're reminded that we also need to forgive ourselves. Here's part two of The Struggle with Guilt. What do you experience when you have feelings of guilt? Now, more than likely, we could ask many people that question and get lots of answers, but sometimes a person says, well, I have a feeling of dread. Uh, Something bad is going to happen when I feel guilty. Or I feel unworthy. Or I feel dirty. I feel stained. 
uh, somehow I feel like a failure. So there are lots of feelings people have when they have feelings of guilt. And more than likely, what we have to ask is also, well, what do you do with these feelings? And what we do with these feelings of guilt will be determined by what we understand about guilt. And so often, we put all feelings of guilt in the same pot. And we respond to all these feelings of guilt the same way, which is a tragic mistake. So what I want to do in this message entitled, because of our series entitled Winning Over the Struggles of Light, this one is entitled Winning Over Our Struggle with Guilt. I want us to look at the three types of guilt that we have to deal with in life and how we respond, because if we don't understand that there's more than one type, then we'll treat them all the same. But first of all, I want to give you a definition of guilt. And if you may just want to jot this down, it might be simple for you to uh, go back and look at it. But guilt is a sense of wrongdoing. It is a sense of wrongdoing and emotional conflict that arises out of having second thoughts on something we've done. It is a sense of wrongdoing and emotional conflict that arises out of second thoughts on something that we have done. And all of us, when we think about what guilt is, it is because we think about something that has happened in the past, or even we thought something that happened in the past, or we thought that we had done wrong, or maybe we did, but it is born out of second thoughts on that. Now, let's talk about the three types of guilt for just a moment. One of them is civil guilt, which uh, is uh, legal guilt. That is, you and I have violated some civil law. For example, if you speed, uh, you violate the law. And if you're caught, of course, uh, whether you feel guilty or not has nothing to do with it. You are guilty if you break a civil law. A second type of guilt is biblical guilt or theological guilt, which is the result of violating not a civil law, but a biblical law, that is, a divine law. If a person steals, they have violated God's law, and whether you feel guilty or not is not the issue. If you violate the law of God, then you are guilty. The third type of guilt is false guilt or psychological guilt, and these are painful feelings that we have that are based on something that has happened in the past or something that uh, uh, we feel about ourselves, but it has no biblical grounds. That is, there is no particular sin. Now, let me say it right up front before we explain it. You may look back in your life and see something that you have done, and you have asked the Lord to forgive you, and He has forgiven you. If you keep bringing up old trash, and you keep feeling guilty over something that God has forgiven you for, that is false guilt. I was talking to a fellow a couple of weeks ago who came by to see me, and we were talking, and so I said to him before he left, I said, well, how can I pray for you? He said, well, you can just pray that I won't feel guilty. I said, well, now, wait a minute. I want to be able to pray properly, and I don't want to be personal, but what do you feel guilty about? He said, well, I don't know. He said, I just feel guilty. He could not name me one single concrete thing for which he felt guilty. He just says, it's just, I just have feelings of guilt. Now, friend, that's false. It is not of God, and He does not want us having those feelings. And so, those kind of feelings do not fit who we are. So, when you look at the reasons for our guilt, there is that psychological guilt, that's false guilt. Now, what about biblical guilt? Well, biblical guilt is this. It is this feeling that I have, this anxiety in my spirit, over a definite, deliberate, that is a willful sin. That is, biblical guilt is the result of committing an act of sin. Now, no time in the Bible does, does we find the Holy Spirit talking about you're bad or you're evil. The Spirit of God convicts us of specific sins. If I have gossiped about someone, if I have stolen something, lied, or committed some act, some violation of Scripture, the Holy Spirit never does say, you're just bad. The Holy Spirit says, that is a sin. The Holy Spirit says, you know you shouldn't have done that. And God always, through His Spirit, identifies what we have done so that our guilty feelings, when they are based on the Scriptures, it is something definitely we can deal with. Well, He says in this passage, but if we walk in the light, as He Himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. 
Now let's talk about, first of all, how do we deal with biblical guilt? That is something that we have done, we know we've sinned against God. How do we deal with that? The first thing we should do is this. We identify the type guilt that I'm experiencing. What, what is this? And if it is for some sin we've committed, something we've not dealt with, we acknowledge that, we confess that, we repent of that, we say, I know this is not of God, it doesn't fit who I am, and I ask God to forgive me of that sin based on 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, when he says, if we confess our sins, listen to this now, and you see some verses we know so well, we know them so well, we can quote the words, but we forget the truth. Listen to this. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, when He says faithful, we know what that means. Dependable, He's always there. He'll do it. When He says just, it means this, that even though you and I have sinned, God can forgive us of that sin based on what? Not based on conduct and behavior, but based on this truth that He sent His only begotten Son, Jesus, to the cross. When Jesus died, He bore all the guilt all the way to rest in upon himself. When he died, he died as a substitution for you and for me. Therefore, he died and paid the penalty. I don't have to pay that penalty. God is a just God who will not make me pay the penalty for something his son has already paid for. So when he says he is faithful, you can trust him to do it. He is just. That is, he is going to treat us in a just fashion. He's not going to hold us guilty for something the son's already paid for. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. How do I deal with true biblical guilt? I deal with it by identifying that it's biblical guilt. I deal with it by confessing that I have been wrong asking him to forgive me of my sin. How many times do I have to ask him to forgive me? One time is sufficient always. Here's what Satan will do. Satan will say, you mean to tell me that you think after what you've done that all you have to do is to get on your knees and ask your heavenly Father to forgive you of that sin as wicked and as vile and as atrocious as it was? You mean to tell me that you think God's going to forgive you simply because you ask him? And Satan, the answer is yes. Why? Because God said so, period. And that's all it needs. Truth is the only thing that sets us free. Truth is the only thing that liberates us from satanic harassment. Satan says, you, listen, you think you're saved? Look what you're doing. You, mean, you think you're saved? Look how you're acting. Satan, I'm saved not because of the way I act or don't act. I'm saved because Jesus went to the cross. He died for my sin. Every single one of my sins was placed upon him. He died as the substitutionary Lamb of God in my place. I am liberated and freed, and I am forgiven of my sin because of what he did, not because of what I did. This is the kind of truth that sets us free. Now, not only is there confession, but there is acceptance of that forgiveness. It's not enough for me to confess it. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's true. But what sets me free? I can confess it, but I'm not free until I accept his forgiveness of my sin. And if I'm genuinely honest about it, then I'm going to try to make amends. That is, if I have wronged someone, taken something, or offended them in some fashion, I will do my best to make amends. There's some sins you can't make amends for. There's some things, if you try to deal with a person that you wronged, uh, would probably make it worse. But there's some things we can make amends for. So if I can, I will. So if it's biblical guilt, I identify it as biblical guilt, I name it, I confess it, I turn away from it, I ask God to forgive me for it, and I accept his forgiveness, and if I can make amends, I will. If I can't, then I won't. Then what happens? Then you move on in life. You do not, listen, you don't stand around and have yourself a pity party. Well, you know, I asked God to forgive me, and I know he has, and I think he has, and I certainly hope he has. None of that stuff. That is all, listen, what you're saying is I believe the devil. Now, listen, I get this. Your spirit would never say, that is the Holy Spirit within you would never say, I know you asked God to forgive you, but he hasn't. You don't deserve it. Look what you've done. You don't deserve forgiveness. That is never of God. That is, we need to get tough with the devil and say, yes, I am forgiven. God said so. You are a liar. You're the father of all lies. And so forget it. Get lost, devil. Because he will do his best to get us to doubt God, which is, what does that do to God? It says you're not all you're cracked up to be. You're not all that you say you are. We deal with the sin. We don't have a pity party. We march on in life and do what God has called us to do. Now, but what about those false guilts. 
What about those experiences of guilt that are false? How do we deal with them? If I'm not guilty of some sin, how do I deal with that? If I'm going to deal with false guilt, I have to identify what's the source of this. Now, here's, here's the feeling I'm having. I'm feeling guilty, but what's the source of it? And I'm saying to you, don't quit, don't give up, and don't stop until you identify the source of that false guilt. There is a source. There is something specific going on in your life that's causing that to happen. You see, if you ask God, I believe that Almighty God will enable you to trace back and you'll find out what is it because here's what will happen. If you ask the Lord that and then all of a sudden, let's say, for example, all of a sudden you begin to feel guilty. In that moment, you ask Him, now, Lord, what's the environment? What's going on around me? What's taking place at this moment that all of a sudden I'm suddenly feeling guilty? What's going on, God? God will show you why. And so you identify what that guilt is now. There are three things you affirm. Now, I want you to jot these down. They're real simple and real short. I'm going to ask them to give, you back, give them back to me in just a minute. You affirm three things. In other words, you've identified the guilt. You've identified the source of it. And you think, hey, that's back there in my childhood. Oh, that's something somebody did to me. This is something that happened to me. You affirm three things. First of all, you affirm this. Here's what you jot down. Number one, I am special. You say, oh, now, wait a minute. You don't know me. So you know where that came from? Straight from the devil. If you're a believer, you're somebody special. Well, what's special about me? Every single one of us is special. We're so special that God loved us so much. Listen, we're so special that He sent His only begotten Son. How special are you? Not only am I special because God sent His only begotten Son to die on the cross to save you from your sin, but you're so special because here's what He said. He said, I have predestined. I've determined beforehand that I'm going to conform you into the likeness of my son. Now, I may have to put sandpaper on you, and I may have to put a chisel on you, and I may have to put a saw on you, but whatever it takes, I'm going to make you just like my son. Now, listen, his son was perfect because his son was God in his sonship. You are so special that God has predestined every single one of us to become like his son. Now, friend, tell me, how much more special can you be? There's not a position. There's not enough wealth. There's not enough recognition. There's not enough anything to equal your being special compared to what God has done to make you special. First of all, I'm special. Secondly, I am loved. And when you think about how much God loves you, not only did He send His only begotten Son, but He forgives you continually. We are living in continuous forgiveness. That's what He's saying. He says in His Word that God demonstrated His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't we get better. God loves us unconditionally, eternally, unalterably, unchangeably, continuously, uninterruptedly. That's the way God loves us. So first of all, we said, I am special. Secondly, I am loved, and thirdly, I am forgiven. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, so when I have these feelings of guilt, how am I going to deal with them? I'm going to identify the source of it, and I'm going to thank God. I'm going to thank God that I understand where that's coming from, and then I'm going to affirm three things. I want you to give them back to me. Number one, I am special. I am loved, and I am forgiven. And when you begin to affirm those three things, then what happens? Here's what's going to happen. You may be one of those persons over which guilt has just hovered. I mean, it's just sort of hovered over you. And all of a sudden, when you begin to affirm, I'm somebody special, made in the likeness of my Lord. I'm somebody who's truly loved, loved by God. I'm someone who's been forgiven. And if I'm forgiven, then what's all this guilty feeling? Where's all this coming from? It's not coming from God. And if it's not coming from God, it's coming from the devil. Then reject it. You simply say, in the name of the Lord Jesus, I reject these feelings of guilt. They have no biblical basis. Therefore, it's false. It's a lie. And I refuse to acknowledge it. And you know what will happen? The cloud's going to disappear. You know why? Because it has no basis and you have put it on the run. Now, when I look at this passage and see what it says, then I know that I have no reason to feel guilty. If there is a deliberate sin, yes. What do you do? You deal with it immediately, and you keep moving. Now, when do you deal with sin? Instantaneously. Remember what we said? We said it's those second thoughts. That's what's involved in guilt. 
If you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you have a reason to feel guilty. Now, let me explain what you're guilty of. You say, well, I have committed so many sins in my life. Do you know what causes a person to be separated from God? It isn't because of all these sins in their life. There's just one sin, and that is to reject His Son as your personal Savior is the sin and the only sin that will cause you to be eternally separated from God. Not all these S-I-N-S, but one sin, the sin of unbelief. God has said the only way to be saved, the only way to get to heaven is by accepting His Son, Jesus, as Savior. You say, well, you know, I'm going to do the best I can, and I'm going to be better, and so somehow I'm going to get there. What you've said is, God, I don't believe what you said. I'm going to do it my way. You're lost. There's only one way to get to heaven. That's through His Son, Jesus. That sin is indeed the grossest sin. It is the worst sin with the greatest penalty any sin can possibly have. It is the sin that separates you not only now, but eternally from God. And I want to ask you to ask Him to forgive you for the sin of unbelief and that you receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. But now what about for those of you who are believers? And you said, well, I've been having those guilty feelings you're talking about. What are you going to do with them? Are you going to keep on having them? Or are you going to say today, I am tired and weary of living under false guilt. I'm going to find out what it is that causes me to do this, causes me to feel this way. I'm going to identify it, and I'm going to thank God it's not true, and I'm just going to affirm who I am in Him that I'm very special. I'm going to affirm His love for me. I'm going to affirm that I am a forgiven child of God, and by faith, I am going to reject and refuse every satanic harassment that tries to make me feel guilty when the truth is I am not. Now, friend, listen, you know how much longer you have to live under that false guilt? Just as long as it takes you to deal with it. And you could deal with it right where you are. In fact, if I were you and I'd been having those feelings, wherever you are, friend, listen, don't even get up out of a chair. Don't even get out of the bed. I don't know what time you may be listening. Right where you are, deal with it. Tell God beginning today, I want you to show me why do I feel these things. And friend, I can tell you something. God wants to set you free. He wants the struggle to come to an end, and He wants you to enjoy a wonderful fellowship with Him, to enjoy life, and to know that you have a wonderful Savior who walks by your side to remind you continuously, you are a forgiven child of God. Thanks for joining us today for In Touch with Dr. Charles Stanley. When we deny ourselves forgiveness, we're obstructing the flow of the love of God. You don't have to wallow in self-condemnation. Enjoy God's love for you. Forgive yourself and leave the guilt of the past behind. It takes time to change the way you think so that it matches the Word of God. If you need some assistance in understanding and applying Scripture, We'd like to help. Browse our website, intouch.org, for devotions, Bible-based study tools, and relevant articles. And that's where you can order a copy of today's complete message, The Struggle with Guilt. It's also included in our teaching set, Winning Over Life Struggles. Again, that's intouch.org, or call 1-800-IN-TOUCH. You can write to us at intouch. Post Office Box 7900, Atlanta, Georgia, 30357. Do you ever feel inadequate to live the Christian life? You're not alone. Today's Moment with Charles Stanley is coming up. We all want to be blessed, but what does being blessed mean to you? Things, family, happiness? No matter what we do, where we go, what we achieve, we always want more, don't we? more time, more money, more peace. We chase after a blessed life, but the problem is our culture makes it difficult to know what being blessed is all about. Jesus made it all clear when he gave his Sermon on the Mount in the Gospel of Matthew. He described a life that doesn't depend on your bank account, where you live or work, or what you own. It's a life that rests not on external circumstances, but on the interior condition of the heart. It's a life that's richer and fuller than anything this world could ever match. 
Join us for Blessed to Be, our year-long focus on the Beatitudes and experience the life you were truly meant to live. Discover more at intouch.org slash blessed. That's intouch.org slash blessed. Christians are imperfect humans who are required to live a holy life. That's a tall order. Here's a moment with Charles Stanley. Now, I wonder how many of you feel inadequate to live the Christian life. I certainly do. When I was saved at the age of 12, the pastor told me, he said, Charles, you'll be a good boy, and one of these days you'll grow up and you'll die and go to heaven. You know, I tried and tried, tried to be good. I, I, I read the Bible and I prayed and, and I fasted and I did all kinds of things. I finally discovered I couldn't be very good at times. And it took me a long time to realize that God's grace was far more adequate than I am. And he knew... He knew I couldn't be good, and he knew the Apostle Paul couldn't be good, and that's why he sent the Holy Spirit, because he knew we could not live the Christian life. But that's what I believe, because that's what I was taught. When he says, be ye holy even as I'm holy, you and I can't live a holy life apart from the work of the Holy Spirit in our life. A holy life doesn't mean a sinless life, but it means a life that's bent toward God. And a life that once there is sin, there is quick confession, repentance, and moving on. You don't have a pity part and say, oh, God, what about this? No, you just confess it and move on because he's already forgiven you at the cross. And we walk, listen, he says we, if we walk in the light and we're walking in the light because he's living on the inside of us, he sealed us, he says, under the day of redemption, not until I sin again. He sealed me under the day of redemption. We are forever his children. And we're living, living in his spirit and by his spirit. But you see, if a person doesn't understand that, and I lived for years and years and years and didn't realize who was on the inside of me, what God was willing to do, what He was able to do, I just thought I had to do it. But to realize that it wasn't my responsibility was a liberating, freeing truth. Learn more about Every Believer's Helper, the Holy Spirit, at intouch.org. If you missed any of today's message, or if you'd like to hear it again, visit our website, You can also stream previous messages from the audio archives or download a variety of podcasts. Find these and many other resources at intouch.org. And if you were challenged or encouraged by today's program, we'd love to hear your story. Has someone hurt you? Maybe the pain has lasted for years. How can you put it behind you? Tomorrow's program reveals the key to winning the struggle with unforgiveness. I hope you'll join us Thursday for In Touch with Dr. Charles Stanley. This program is a presentation of In Touch Ministries, Atlanta, Georgia, and remains on this station through the grace of God and your faithful prayers and gifts.